the valley was gone. We hear that the heavy is there, but we never get up to the bar to bring the breakfast up to bed. Hey, welcome to episode 35 of the God's Own Scale podcast. Uh, keen listeners uh, will have noticed that I've absolutely messed up the numbering of the episodes. Uh, and I think I've had two episodes 33s and maybe an episode 34. I think it's episode 35, but who's counting? Um, today I have with me uh, a young man who is setting up in business in the 3D printing world um he's not new to it uh because he's run a couple of other kickstarters but there's a current kickstarter running um which i think listeners to this podcast may be interested in so without further ado i'm going to introduce you to mr henry turner hi henry how are you hi there i'm very well thank you nice sunday evening it's beautiful isn't it i've, I've been yeah. around to a friend's barbecue and i think i've got a little bit of sunstroke <laughs> But uh, I, so if you hear a clunk, I, I've collapsed. But listen, don't okay, I'll listen out. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> um, Henry, it's great. It's great to get you on uh, to chat about this uh, Kickstarter that you've got going. This is probably my second or third chat now to people with uh, either Kickstarters or working in the three D printing world. Um, and we're going to get on to chat about that very shortly because it's really quite an exciting project that you've got on the go but as i do with any new guests of the podcast i like to have a peek under the hood or behind the curtain of who henry turner is uh regarding the hobby aspect so just give us a bit of a background please uh, as how you got into the hobby and and got you to where you are today well i guess i look at that in sort of two ways uh how i got into wargaming and how i got into 3d printing because they sort of are two distinct hobbies but with wargaming, I, I guess it's not at all atypical, at least for, you know, British guys. Um, I started out with Warhammer, you know, Games Workshop IP. Um, did actually first get into that when I was like seven years old, but the results are pretty predictable. Namely, I think I just dunked my marine straight in paint pots and, it, you know, it wasn't great. Uh, but I got back into all that when I was about 17. Um, you know, played it through university. But when I uh, left the UK and went to Russia over there, um, I didn't really have access to, to much 40K stuff. So I got into historicals and I played Napoleonics in 172, uh, got a gaming club there to take up Black Powder. Um, but since getting back to the UK, you know, with lockdown and whatnot, uh, I'm, I'm not really gaming at all. Uh, I've changed where I've lived frequently enough that I haven't really found any you know, local clubs or anything. So hoping to get back into all that. Um, but with 3D printing, that was something I started toward the tail end of uh, 2019, uh, just as a hobby at first. Okay, so you've mentioned quite an interesting aspect of your background there about Russia. Um, you're the first person onto the podcast that I know of that speaks Russian. Um, so <laughs> if, if you don't mind, just give us a... a, a a little bit of a pricey of what that part of your life was like oh well um i first started studying russian because i was dating a russian girl at the time um but when that ended that was still here in the uk i kind of hung on to it because i'd always been interested in, in the country and i thought well i got a bit of like a sunk cost fallacy going on at the moment and uh, i actually decided to go to russia for a um a three-month intensive course at a language school there and while I was living uh, living there, it was in um, Novosibirsk, which is the third biggest city in Russia. It's literally in the center of the country, like right in the middle of Siberia. Um, while I was there, I just liked it so much and actually got offered a job as an English teacher that, that I ended up staying. And uh, before I knew it, I had my own flat. I was married, had cats, and uh, ended up living there for six years. Um, Unfortunately, not all ended well. I'm afraid I do have to report my divorcee. Uh, but a positive to come out of it was that um, after that episode, I needed something to sort of distract me and occupy my attention. And that's actually when I started 3D modeling was a sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, the the reaction to that as a sort of a distraction. Um, then this whole, you know, inconvenient Corona business kicked off and uh, couldn't teach anymore, couldn't tutor. So... I started leaning more and more into 3D printing as my sole income while I was out there. And in the end, I decided to come back to the UK uh, 
just because we well, yeah, I don't want to make your podcast political or anything, but I, I do have to confess that I I can't say I was a fan of where Russia was, but I'm certainly not a fan of where they're headed. And I was at the point where I had legal residency. I was considering citizenship, but I thought, no, I, you know, I can't be a part of this anymore. And uh, I headed back here. Um, and now I'm just yeah, still doing the 3D design full time, uh, but still sort of thinking where I want to settle within the UK itself. Yeah, that sounds like an incredible story. I mean, um, I think you you sent me a link through to a piece in The Guardian um, where you describe your journey um, and you end up in this out of the way place. Yeah, a, a younger and a bit more um, enamoured version of myself, certainly when uh, when it was still a tremendous modesty. Yes, but I, I did write a piece in The Guardian going on about how wonderful Siberia is. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And that, although this is the third largest city in in russia um i don't think many english people have ever heard of it no. you, you'd know it if you were uh like uh, you know it as a stop in the trans-siberian and i think it has a pretty like prominent role in uh world war ii with relocation of industry but it is just the sort of industrial smear on the landscape to be honest um the the locals like there, there was this kind of funny meme that went around there about like novosibirsk in winter and it was a uh, just a picture of um picture of the street with like a gray scale legend on the side of just how everything's a shade of white or various grays to black because like in the winter you just see no color it's just gray buildings gray sky muddy snowy well dirty snowy ground like but i, I don't know part of me likes the bleakness i think uh, i think some element of my personality enjoys that same reason why like when you're abroad away from the uk you kind of miss that overcast weather you know There's yes yeah something endearing about it I think you described it as living in a Charlie Chaplin film. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yes, that's in the article, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's interesting. There's a, a wargaming scene there then. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I, I said earlier that I couldn't really hold on to 40K there. That wasn't because 40K isn't there. Um, 40K is everywhere, of course. It's just more that I wasn't willing to buy it all again, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, out there people were playing 40K uh, and Flames of War. Those are the two most popular in the city. Um, but I, I don't know. I might make some enemies saying this, but I don't think Flames of War is very good. <laughs> I played it a couple of times there. Um, I hadn't played it really at all in the UK. I think I had one demo game, but I, I tried to get properly into it in Russia. I did buy an army because, uh, if you know that the model manufacturer, um, Zvezda, yes. um, yeah, their, their kits are like really cheap out there. Like you can get like a T-34 or whatever for like a pound oh, fifty okay. or whatever. Um, so I did, I did build like an army and I got into that, but it was just, yeah, it's just not, it's not great. I don't really like the, you go, I go format when you're doing modern warfare. Yeah. I think that, that rules out a lot of games, of course, but, uh, the moment I decided I didn't like that game was when we were doing a North Africa scenario and I had some enemy tiger like in front of me and my crusader was just able to just dash across in front of this tiger circle around behind it and just leisurely shoot it up the jack and i'm thinking right. like in real life you could not just headlong charge under the justification it's my go and the tiger's not allowed to shoot at you you know yeah it's stretching it a bit isn't it to be honest yeah it sort of broke my immersion <laughs> yes exactly and that's what this hobby's all about isn't it immersion you want to oh yeah absolutely i mean um so i'm not really much of a war gamer even before i was doing designing i was much more just about the painting and collecting but i always did so with a kind of an eye that whatever i collect should be playable should the move take me but my, my attention span isn't really sufficient i don't have a particularly mathematical brain so the whole you know theory crafting and list building that doesn't really appeal to me but what i, what I love is just the the spectacle you know when yeah. you've got like a really well decorated table with beautifully painted models on it and you just watching the clash like that's what i find appealing and that's why if we get onto napoleonics i'm sure obviously we're going to later but uh i always am an advocate for the bright colors with the hues that are brighter than perhaps the historical examples and the full kind of ideal dress uniform rather than you know campaign overalls and, this, and such because it's all about that kind of idealized aesthetic for me um and that's what wargaming is it's kind of just like this very colorful representation of uh historical periods that you know we love uh, yeah yeah and, yeah and i think i can't remember who said this it was fairly recently it was probably on a different podcast but somebody said um the favorite point for them is uh if they're going to play a game it's the point where they've set everything up 
but before any dice have been rolled, they can just take a step back, look at the table, look at the figures, and think, yeah, that 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 looks really good. Yeah. Well, um, that, regardless of how the game goes. In all honesty, I'm sure like most of us photograph our games before we start, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole reason you do it, isn't it? It's just because it looks good, and yeah. you're about to ruin it all. That's right. Yes. With the coke cans and tape measures and counters and all this. Uh, uh, other stuff that gets uh, gets on the table at various points, but yeah, yeah. I think I think that aesthetic uh, and that immersion is very important for most people, isn't it? In Russia, um, our, our club was in a basement, and with regards to the stuff that we decorated on the table, uh, it was right near a corner shop where you could buy like two liters of beer for sixty p. So generally, it was plastic cups and just beers covering our table. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that that does. Uh ruin the immersion somewhat but uh, it makes it more social i guess yeah um okay so uh you, you came back to the uk uh searching around for something to do and 3d printing uh came to your mind well i mean i was already doing it so uh i i, I first got involved in in 3d printing um doing ships and the reason for that was like while i was still in russia i wanted to this was before, you know, Warlord did a uh, Black Seas. I, yeah. I wanted to, to paint some Age of Sail ships, but um, the prices just were not doing it for me. And I, I don't want to, like, you know, badmouth Langton or anything like that. Obviously, you've got more affordable options like Nabor and so on. But but just the price of, like, getting some ships together and, and getting them shipped to Russia as well was just quite steep. Yeah. And I really didn't like the one 1,200 scale. Um, again, leaning back into aesthetics, I just don't think that really looks as appealing on the table. It's not as much of a pleasure to paint. So I wanted to, to make my own ships. Um, I did try Blender, but I, I completely failed at it. So I just started making ships out of balsa wood. But um, after my divorce, when, uh, like I said, I just really wanted a distraction, I, I, I threw myself back into Blender again. And I think I have to give credit, uh, credit here to uh, Simon Mann. I don't know if you know him. No, I'm not familiar. Oh, he's a he's a designer, um, also of ships uh, like one seven hundred scale. Okay. Um, I I saw what he was doing and I just thought it was amazing, so I got in touch with him. I uh, just asked him what he does, how he does it, and he actually gave me a lot of pointers and advice. Uh, looked at my first models, gave feedback, and uh, unfortunately, I, I then at his suggestion started uploading these ships to sell on the same website as him, Wargaming 3D, and, and now I guess we're the most direct competitors, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, now I'm on figures, I hope I'm yeah not I'm not really muscling on his territory so much anymore. Yeah. But I, I, owe, I owe a lot to him. I, I just wanted to make sure I name dropped him. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, got, I started out making ships because I personally wanted them. And then when I realized I could do it and people would give me money for that, uh, I was just selling them on a uh, on board gaming 3d and and my first kickstarter was uh, was a ship project actually it was a uh, 17th century ones gilded sails was the name uh it, when i got back to the uk i had already run two of yeah two kickstarters had already been finished and i was i was doing the third but i i decided i guess that i was going to do it full time here simply because i couldn't really think of a, another job you know like yeah so, some people of whom i'm eternally envious are born and it seems right from the get-go they know that oh i want to be a doctor i want to be a lawyer whatever i i never had that sense of direction and i've never worked a job that i didn't loathe and this is the first thing i've done where i actually have some sincere passion and energy about it you know i can i can throw myself at it literally most days i'm, I'm working from seven in the morning until uh six seven p.m yeah pretty much every day including today okay. um and that's that's because, you know, I'm in that very enviable position where I can say I'm actually monetizing a hobby. Like it's something I, I started out sincerely doing for my own enjoyment. Um, so, so, yeah, sorry. I mean, I'm springing in here just sort of correcting your question. I was just saying that it was before I got to the UK, I decided I was doing this. I, I did uh, move to London when I first got back there and I had to pay rent things. So I had a, a stint working in a pub kitchen and then, uh, then in Waitrose as well uh, for got back into doing this full time again as quickly as I could. Well, it's got to be better than working in pub kitchens and waitress, surely. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you were already familiar with the technology then, obviously, before you decided to um, uh, 3D sculpt uh, ships. Well, um, to be honest, no, I, I didn't actually see 
or interact with a 3D printer until I got back to the UK. So right. for a good few months in Russia, I was sort of, well, my first models were designed for FDM printing and uh, Cura, which is a sizing program for FDM printers, um, will just tell you if something will or won't print. So I was just going entirely off that. I, I never saw a physical sample of one of my models. I never test printed one myself. People would volunteer to test print them for me and send pictures. So like I knew they worked, but um, no, the, the technology was a complete mystery to me. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, it sounds rather dark now I think about it <laughs> retrospectively, but uh, yeah, I just, I just assumed if I designed them that I would find someone in Novosibirsk who could print them for me. That didn't yeah. happen, but I'd already made models and already made a bit of money off them. So I just continued with it. But these must be the journeys that most people go on when they're first starting out in the industry. And and there will be mistakes. It's not like you're going to come out with a perfect business model oh, I, on made, day one, surely. I've made so many mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that you know, that's that's you learn from those things. You learn from yeah. mistakes and and amend and uh, iterate and and move on. But um, I'm interested though in the actual design process so um you you've designed this ship that you want other people to print mm -hmm. but uh, how have you gone about that is that a technology that you're familiar with um so if you're talking about how how the designing of the ships work works um generally you find a historic plan and you just project that as a two-dimensional template into your 3d workspace mm -hmm. um if we're, if we're going with like a British ship, the, the plans for those are actually very convenient in that they have the the stern and bow lines on the same sheet to scale with the profile. So you can actually use the same image for modeling both, you know, the, the front and back of the ship and the side. So I just put that plan in. I figure out what the um, the beam width, how wide the ship would be, is at 1700 scale. And I scale the plan to that. And then I just project a hull along along the lines and using pre-mapped i'm just going to betray like how i'm actually quite ignorant on a uh, ship terminology uh, the, the ribs running up and down the ship listen, the, it, that may well be the correct term i have no i idea. hope it's rib <laughs> uh, no, more, I know so, what you're talking about though i know what you're talking about when you say rib but whether I, it's right I, mean, or not, I have no idea i have quite severe imposter syndrome because some people are are really keen on naval stuff, you know, and yeah. they'll they'll send me a message saying, "Oh, Henry, I was looking at one of your models, and I noticed that just after the second main bowsprit gunwale, <laughs> uh, there appears to be a dally whacker that's a bit out of." And I, I just have to say, "Oh, um, you got a picture?" No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I I just I just uh, model each rib because and I, I've, I've explained it all in the wrong order, but I'll already have done like a kind of a line tracing on each rib of the ship, which I'll then project along the profile, right. and I just sculpt the hull al along that, and then I just go from there. I I didn't feel it massively creatively fulfilled by it because people would tell me like that I was talented or I'd made a beautiful model, but I'm like I'm just I'm just playing dot the dot, you know, like right. I'm literally yeah. tracing on top of someone else's work. It's not really much um, creativity. Mm. Figures are, are much more fulfilling in that respect because you're, you're actually making that and you're, it's so much more subjective what you put into it. Whereas a ship, like in theory, if you gave me and you gave, say, Simon, you know, who I already mentioned, if you gave us both like the same plan, we would probably produce, if not the same, then a very similar model. Yes. And uh, so, yeah, it's not not quite artistic, but th that's how I got started. I mean, I was so scared of the prospect of actually doing people. Uh, I couldn't have imagined it when I started that on my Facebook group. There are still some old pictures where I made like my first attempts at a human face. And it just looks like a potato Putin. <laughs> there may be a market for potato Putins, but I I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, Putin would be a nice kid's toy, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, you, you get back to the UK and you, you're starting then uh, in the Kickstarter model of business. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose that over any any other route? Was was that just so, for ease of ease of process for yourself? I I, I think. I'm trying to I'm trying to think how to answer this question without making my, myself sound like a horrible mercenary capitalist. Um, I think Kickstarter is just the 
the best way to actually make a reasonable income. Yeah. Uh, if you're if you're working like on let's say Wargaming 3D, which is where I was first I first set up shop. Uh, for those who don't know, that is just an online website. Online website, sorry. That's just a website where you uh, can just find STL files that you pay for and download. It's much like uh, Cults or CG Trader, but it's uh, specifically for historical wargaming. Okay. Um, I could put a model up there, sell it for three dollars fifty or whatever, and over its lifespan, on average, most models there make me about fifty to one hundred dollars total. Yeah. Um, that's that's not really a whole lot. Some no. will make me nothing. There have literally been some that have sold maybe like one one example yeah uh, you're kind of just trying to guess what the community wants and you put the work in and for very little compensation something like a kickstarter you got that amazing combination of a very visible project that a lot of people can find and you're actually gauging interest in advance and of course stretch goals uh, allow you to to flesh out a project in a whole range but only if you're kind of paid in advance. I mean, it's an amazing proposition on paper, isn't it? It's like saying, here's a thing I want to make that I haven't made yet, but if you give me the money now, I might get it to you in a few months. It, it yes. is a bit sketchy. So um, I generally, like, my approach has changed, as I've learned, but my, my current approach to Kickstarter is that I complete a core range, and that's finished, 100% ready to go. In the case of the Napoleonics, the uh, Prussians, Russians, Austrians, and French, like, their core sets are ready to go right now. Um, I complete that. But then everything else is um, sort of just dangling there. If it gets enough money, I'll make them. If not, I won't. And it, it's kind of a almost minimal risk in that in that respect. Yeah. Um, these Napoleonics, especially, I actually made in a bit of a manic state. I, I produced the models themselves in about two weeks, which is probably the fastest I've ever turned around a whole range. But I was just working like a demon. Yeah. The uh, I think with Kickstarter, reputations can rise or fall, can't they? Mm -hmm. If you develop a reputation as somebody who delivers the, the end product, and particularly with um, STL files or, or the 3D printing, um, it's not like you're waiting 12 months for a product to be physically made and then shipped out. No. Um, so, uh, and like conversely, if uh, if people fail to deliver, then very quickly trust is lost um, with the community and it, it becomes a very difficult model to pursue, I suspect. But um, So your first Kickstarter was, uh, did you say Gilded Sale? Gilded Sales, yeah. Yeah, So uh, and that was shipped. So how long ago was that? Oh, that was, I think, the end of 2019. Um, I'd made a whole bunch of kind of simplistic uh, 18th century ships, you know, Carinade era, Nelson kind of time. Yeah. And I just personally really love how the older ships look, you know, 17th century with the very ornate Baroque uh, sterns and so on. And I, I wanted to make one for myself as a bit of a challenge, but realizing that no one else had really done them in like 1600 or 1700, and that uh, Oak and Iron, if you know that game, yes, I do. Yeah. Oak and Iron had, uh, I don't remember if it had just come out or if it had only been out for a short while. I, I just thought, well, if no one else is doing this and, uh, you know, I've already made one trial ship, why not try actually see if I can get a Kickstarter going out of it? And I think it made 1.8K. But I, I, made, I was making that in the evening while I was working a day job. I was still uh, an English teacher then. Yes. Um, yeah, that that was sort of the first foray, and it, it went very well. It was it was amazing. I mean, um, I I guess only people that run Kickstarters like necessarily know this firsthand. But there was just such this kind of rush when when you realise that people are actually willing to to part with money for something you're making. And uh, I'm sure many of us, like in wargaming, have kind of daydreamed before about what it would be like to actually uh, create our own ranges yeah. or have creative control over the models we make and play with. So. But yeah, it was just amazing, that first project. And a lot of first experiences, like uh, having to set up the page, get get the graphics design, communicating with the community and so on. It was, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, one that caught my eye, particularly for, for my own personal interest, was the mm. uh, American Civil War range that you released. Uh, was that January 2020? Yeah, yes. Uh, it was shortly after the um, Cape St. Vincent, which was another Age of Sail one. So it was actually a case where I was running two Kickstarters at the same time. 
And in the spirit of full disclosure, I should actually say that the uh, the ACW Kickstarter is still ongoing. It's going to be completed by July, but yeah. uh, still delivering the final stretch goals on that one. But yes, that was my first uh, figure-based one. It's the first thing that wasn't shipped. So how, how did you find that transition then from, um, as, you, as you mentioned earlier on, you were taking uh, the real designs of these ships and mm. sort of transposing it in, into a computer program and joining the dots, but with figures uh how did you move from a potato poutine to <laughs> something that you thought was well worth putting out there to the wargaming community so it all um essentially since i started doing all this i haven't been able to have free time conscientiously what i mean is stuff like playing video games and that i find really difficult uh just to do and sort of feel like i'm not slacking off so i had this problem where I didn't have the energy to carry on with, say, the ship making I had to do for the day. And I was just sort of zoning out, losing concentration, but I could justify sucking off on something else. So I started structuring my day so that I would have experimental time. I would do like um, seven to eight hours uh, of my core work, and then I'd have two hours to just mess around on Blender doing random stuff. And what that meant was that in the evenings, I was doing things like trying to sculpt uh, 40k orc ripoffs, which I've never released yeah. <laughs> for ethical reasons. But yeah, I was trying to like emulate uh, Games Workshop models. I tried maybe two or three times to make Napoleonic models. Um, and ACW, I tried a few times. I first tried to do 6 mil, 28 mil, and then uh, the 15 mil sculpts that ended up being um, Union Sunder. But so, so what I mean to answer your question is that like that was actually kind of the result of lots and lots of trial and error. Yeah. Um, the hardest parts are obviously faces, which I guess most people could like predict, um, and uh, and hands, which really surprised me going in. I never, I didn't think they would be so difficult, but uh, there are just so many ways to approach making them. Um, but the, the way I just went from potato Putin was just essentially just trying and trying and trying again, and I guess. The fact that I went from Potato Putin to trying to sculpt orcs was a logical step because if you can't sculpt like a good-looking human face, just try and make some ugly alien, right? Yeah, sure. It kind of stems from there. The I, I still feel really guilty about how the Civil War project got started, though, because I decided that I didn't want to release any Kickstarters until, as I described, the core range was actually finished and done. I wanted to be able to guarantee that I'd be delivering something to people. But um, <laughs> while I'd been putting together this this range, uh, Warlord Games announced their epic black powder stuff and people who knew I was working on the ACW things because I would share on Facebook like some preview images of stuff I'd been working on for fun. We're just saying, hey, have you seen what Warlord's doing? Like, you should capitalize. You should get this out. And I thought, this paranoid part of my mind thought, oh, God, someone else will, won't they? And it was when I saw, I'm really sorry, I don't remember his name, but there was a French chap who really quickly within like a couple of weeks of uh, Epic Black Powder coming out, he he had a crowdfunding campaign up and that just sort of forced my hand. I thought, right, I have to release these, but yeah. they were half baked. And uh, I was honest about that, but it meant there was just this really rocky launch where I was just putting stuff out as it was done. And then horrifyingly, like by the end of the first week, I realized, and I, I know this is going to sound like so pedantic, but I think if you know about grognards and button counters, you'll understand why this felt like the apocalypse. Um, <laughs> I realized that the infantry were missing their haver sex. Okay. And so I had to re-export everything, which was about uh, a one and a half weeks more, just solid work. Cause the, the worst thing was it wasn't the sculpting. Sculpting is quite easy, but actually getting the models exported and fixing the meshes and uploaded, uh, yeah, sorry. I mean, I know I'm going off on a bit of ramble, but Not just uh, it was quite the it was a bit of a a bodge a bodge job that launch, and uh, this one's going to be much smoother, I think. Okay. But, uh, lessons <laughs> were learned. I think in the future I shouldn't let other people's actions rush me. So just because Warlord put something out doesn't mean that that I have to. Um, yeah, Pretty and funded. right now it funded, didn't it? So yes, yes, it did. Yes, yeah. it did very well. Yeah. Um, and what where this might happen again? I'm, saying that somewhat humorously, but uh, I actually have a Soviet range, so some Cold War 1980s Soviets that's about 70% complete. And again, that's just stuff I've been sculpting in my free time. Yeah. Um, but I don't know when, when I should re release that, really. Uh, I, I, I don't mind having two Kickstarters simultaneous, so long as one of them is like near the end and the other one's just starting, you know. 
but if I were literally releasing like two at once, like at the same point, I think that does look a bit dodgy, understandably so. Yeah. You don't want yeah. to be the kind of guy that's just spamming out those projects that are going to go unsupported. But I'm quite eager to get them out because personally, I love um, I love the Cold War and uh, I really want to play um, Battle Group Northag, mm. but I do not like their miniatures, and that's actually why I started sculpting them. Well, that must be a great incentive, actually. If if you've got a set of rules that's out there and an established set of rules like Battle Group Northag, um, and you're not enjoying the ranges that are available currently, then uh, you're in the perfect position to do that. But with the American Civil War, it's, it's interesting because the American Civil War is my, well, one of my, the two, my main two periods of interest. Oh, okay. um, but I, I don't have access yet to uh, a printer. I, I keep saying yet because it, I came very close um, two or three days ago. Some uh, A friend had got one that he wanted to move on. Um, but he, he sort of he's not a great salesman because he talked me out of buying it. He said, <laughs> he said somebody who's got some experience needs to be buying this because it, 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 it's something very British, isn't it? Our tendency to be self-defeating. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because I was there with the cash, I was on the verge of buying it, and you know, I I'd, I I'd, I'd, I'd previously said I, I'm not sure this technology is for me, as because I'm quite an old man, Henry. You might not be able to tell that by my well, voice. But... <laughs> uh, let's um. Let's uh, just promise that like, we'll we'll dedicate a portion of this me to do a big public announcement. What what do you call them? The uh, public information broadcast where I'll try sell three D printing to you and the people. Um, but if if you wanted to ask about the ACW as well, well yeah, because uh, it's such a period of interest of mine, and we are this is a six mil podcast, but it's yeah. it's well known that I'm uh, heavily into fifteen mil as well. So when I saw those when I saw that you'd got a Kickstarter for fi- and this was in the last couple of days when I saw that you'd run a Kickstarter for 15 mil American Civil War it piqued my interest even further um, and I'll, I'll tell you why your current Kickstarter has piqued my interest as well because that, that's another sort of uh, line of interest for me but what what I wanted to say was how nice those sculpts are um, as somebody who's played American Civil War for Oh gosh, thirty plus years in scales from two mil to twenty eight mil, thirty two mil. Then the, I, I really rated the sculpts, um, and uh, the pr- certainly the printed examples or painted examples that you've got on on the page there really do the technology justice. Well, um, I have to say thank you, just because. Um... When, when I first launched that, I was um, very self-consciously kind of just seeing what a lot of people's feedback was. And uh, I remember reading on some German forum where someone had actually linked that Kickstarter and the top comment uh, said something like, those are like ill-proportioned dwarves. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember like a single tear rolling down my cheek. Oh, well, um, <laughs> it's nice to hear. I hope, I hope my comments assuage that feeling and uh, that that disappointment. But uh, and I'm well, some gonna... some people do not like chunky monkeys. That's all I can say. I they they were very, it was a very conscious attempt to imitate Peter Pig, uh, who I will gladly sing the virtues of because any kind of fifteen mil uh, project I've attempted, I've always made sure I have Peter Pig sculpts in there because I just I again going back into the aesthetics, I I just love like I said, exaggerated colors. And I, I think the proportions feed into that. I, if I look at, and, and I'm sorry to, you know, bad mouth the range, but this is just my subjective opinion. But if I look at something like Perry's, yeah, I know that's 28, but they go for kind of a true scale, realistically proportioned human. Yes. It just doesn't look so good from tabletop height, you know, no. to, to me, I, I think you need the, the big heads, and the big hands. And, yeah. Um, but well, thank you for, for saying you like the ACW stuff. Well, um, that, that's incredibly interesting. Um, because I, I don't know if you know this, Henry, but I'm I'm personal friends with Martin, the sculptor at Peter Pig. I saw you visited, yes. Yeah, I was there, I was there uh, last week, um, and I, I've known him for twenty plus years, and I've sat next to him as he has sculpted uh, these figures out of green stuff with little fifteen mil dollies on the stuck into a bit of cork and lots of uh, tools and, and what have you, and um, there, there's certainly a figure. Well. Listen, my oh gosh, I, I, I would say ninety nine percent of the fifteen mil figures I own are Peter Pig figures, so I'm a huge fan, and and that clearly is why I I enjoyed looking at your fifteen mil uh, Civil War range, and if I got 
if I've got access to a 3D printer, I would be printing them out by the book hmm. load. <laughs> Certainly, because you're talking about pennies, aren't you? I think per yeah. figure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, I I did sit down and try to figure this out, but I think in six mil with the, with the new Napoleonics, you can print off five battalions, and you've got four guys in a base. There's uh, ten bases per unit. So what's that? That's forty. Real time math here, people. Yes. Uh, am I mad? Two hundred. <laughs> Five times Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred figures for about uh, eighty pence. Oh my god! I mean, that is just so, you, you. This is perhaps something we'll go on to a little bit later, Henry. But yeah, I imagine at some point in the near future, traditional manufacturers are going to struggle to compete. Well. Let me give my controversial hot take. I think that if Games Workshop doesn't just start selling STLs soon, yeah. Well, listen, if they, if they can threaten a billion-dollar company, then uh, the, most of the cottage industry, back garden shed uh, companies that uh, make up 95% of this hobby, they're, they're certainly going to be struggling, I would imagine. I, I have a sort of um, a well-trodden tirade I would like to go down about uh, 3D printing as viability. I've, I've told myself that we'll kind of like compartmentalize that and I guess discuss that at the end. Okay, um, okay. Well, I, I would happily talk about the, the, the end of traditional manufacturing oh, a while later. This could be the um, most controversial podcast I've ever <laughs> released. Uh, we'll stick I, a pin in that and come back to it at the end. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you one, one quick question. Yeah. Um, you said you're intimidated. Well, sorry, I'm putting words in your mouth, but uh, no, that's, that's print, printing, let's say, is possibly intimidating. Um, how do you feel about the blender side? Because I think what I have tried to do, which I'm very passionate about, and as far as I know, isn't really that common with, with other creators, is I've always tried with the figures. I say always, two projects so far. But thus far, I've tried to make the original uh, 3D files on Blender actually available to backers. Mm. And they're organized there in a modular fashion was was that something you're able to take a look at yourself uh well as you've been talking I, I i've always got a notebook uh next to me whenever i speak to guests and i've written blender down as the first word oh, yeah. uh, because i am ignorant of the technology i've i've looked at your uh your current kickstarter page and the video that you you've got there uh, yeah that runs and shows sort of I'm, I'm guessing that's the program, isn't it, Blender, where you're sort of almost building a bespoke yeah. figure to suit your own needs. That, that, that's what I wanted to talk about is just, I think, uh, even if the sculpts themselves uh, were somewhat unremarkable in the sense that they don't really offer anything that isn't on offer from other ranges, um, what's, what's really cool about having the Blender files available is that I've configured them in such a way that the figures are sort of, sectional and compartmentalized so you can actually toggle different aspects of them so if we take like uh the standard marching french french fusilier there's a checkbox there that you can toggle them into a flank company figure which makes epaulettes uh, appear and ships the position of his uh, bayonet adds a sword uh, bayonet on uh you can change the headgear i've got like eight different uh bicorn sculpts uh shakos uh, this is just for the Frenchman, obviously, that shako can have a plume added, it can have a brush, or you can print it with just the pom-pom. The, the idea being that you can just completely tailor-make your figures. I, I had a message today from one guy who was saying, oh, Henry, uh, are you going to be selling those French only with their overalls over their gaiters? I want gaiters over overalls. And I just said to him, buy, buy the blender package, because you can literally, that's one of the options, is uh, yeah. at the moment I've got... Overalls over gaiters, gaiters over overalls, and tall boots over overalls. I think it's overalls and not trousers, but uh, yeah. And and that's something cool, but a lot of people are really intimidated because they, they think it's really scary. Um, I'm going to be offering uh, documentation, like step-by-step -step written tutorials, but I've done video tutorials already. Mm. It, it, it's really not that scary. And one of the coolest things, I, I, I first used this system on the ACW project. And if you go on my Facebook community group, there are so many pictures posted there by older gentlemen who uh, have actually got around the technology and are printing their own custom figures. I've had like all this feedback, like I've been able to actually produce the kind of range I wanted for the longest time because, yeah. you know, any kind of like minute complaint you might have about positioning of things or if you want bayonets or don't want bayonets, that kind of thing, like it's all fixable if you sit down and uh, just try to get acquainted with the software. And I've tried to make that as accessible as possible, but 
I'm sorry if I'm artificially strong arming that into the conversation here, but it was something I really wanted to mention because even if uh, even if it's not always unique to my projects, it's something I just want to see actually taken up by other designers as well because I think it's really backwards thinking how a lot of people try to emulate physical models uh, either by making single sculpts or multi-part kits that you print as kits when we should really be embracing what's unique about our medium and actually you know kind of democratizing the design process almost by like letting people themselves tailor the models um yeah and that i, I think that's what actually a lot of the people who did back the acw project and gone to this one a lot of people have said like that's why is because they just like having access to those Right. Well, let's let's add that onto the conversation at the end because that this sure. is a re, this is that is a fascinating point that you've brought up and an incre for me as an old guy it's an incredibly exciting development that if 15 years ago you told me that I can make my own figures at home in, in whatever kit I want in whatever shako bike or what, what plant companies, center companies, or whatever, then you know I'm, that's that's the equivalent of saying uh, you know we're going to walk on the moon uh, in in 1932 or something. You know it's completely it's science fiction to me, Henry. Um, so let's come back to that because I, I want to have a really good chat about that because I, I'm I'm very excited about that technology and uh, the the development of it. So let's go into let's come up to date then to your current kickstarter okay. because uh we are a six mil podcast and this is a six mil kickstarter isn't it ostensibly yes uh the sculpts are sculpted for six mil and that's the default size but i'm marketing it as being six to 18 yeah. so i will concede that at 18 mil they do look fairly chunky like i said these are beefy boys <laughs> okay we've been well fed on campaign yeah. um okay so, so give us the elevator pitch then for what this uh what this Kickstarter is. Okay, so we uh, we have a core set which is themed around 1805-1806. Uh, it's got French, Austrians, uh, Russians and Prussians, uh, with the first three being in their 1805 geysers and the Prussians being good for, you know, Jena, uh, Auerstadt. Uh, in addition to that, there are two paid expansions, uh, add-ons. Uh, the first one is the Peninsula War, you know, sort of by popular demand. Uh, that's got uh, the British, the Spanish, and the Portuguese in it. And the second expansion is called the Germanic Miners, which is a bit of a clunky title, I admit. But I couldn't think of anything swish. Uh, which that, that's is... not people who go on to dig underground, is it? You're not talking about no, people no. with picks. No, no. Um, I, I, I get the distinction, don't worry. <laughs> well, that's, that's jolly good, yeah. Uh, it's Bavaria, Saxony, Sweden, and Wittenberg. But if we're very lucky with the stretch goals, we'll also be adding um, Baden and Denmark to those. So 11 nations, definitely, possibly 13 nations total. And uh, the, the contents for each nation consist of uh, basic infantry stands, uh, infantry command stands, flank companies where relevant, and grenadiers. And if we look at the stretch goals that funded so far, uh, we're also adding skirmishes onto that, including the 95th rifles. I got so many messages asking, are they going to be the 95th rifles? You know, people watch Sharp and then... Yeah, of course. Suddenly it's the most important guys who ever existed, right? Yeah, it's not a Napoleonic range if you haven't got Sharp in it. Let's well, it. It, 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 it was uh, originally going to be pitched as just Austerlitz, but yeah, I kind of expanded the scope. <laughs> I, I, I sort of have a personal pet peeve, and again, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to alienate people in saying this, but I think we might slightly, possibly, maybe a little bit overrepresent Waterloo in wargaming and the <laughs> as well. And really, the more important battles, in my most humble opinion, happened on the continent elsewhere. Yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to make sure those were modeled. I mean, the Napoleonic Wars lasted what, uh, what, twenty-three years, something like that, and we do tend to concentrate on a hundred days, right at the end, and uh, one, one or two uh, conflict uh, battles within the peninsula. But uh, yeah, certainly uh, it, it's a lot wider. And I, I'm glad you've said Austerlitz because that's I hinted earlier that uh, this, this particular Kickstarter has piqued my interest because Austerlitz is probably the battle i've read most about during the uh, napoleon wars I'm, I'm no napoleonic expert american civil war first world war sort of my two 
if you were to put me on mastermind, they would be my two chosen subjects. But um, I do have this sort of, I, I keep this watch eye on the Napoleonic period and, and Austerlitz certainly is the battle that fascinates me most out of any of them. And this Kickstarter screams Austerlitz at me. Well, yeah, um, unfortunately it hit the character limit. Um, so I couldn't type anymore, but the original <laughs> draft had this uh, nice long intro bit of prose all about Austerlitz uh, right. because that, that was very much what I was aiming for. Yeah. Um, I'm glad the great, uh, we, we, we've had a stretch goal fund that means the models will also be provided with optional great coats, which is a good thing because Austerlitz was actually in December. Uh, That's so right. There's a bit of snow yeah. on the ground. So some pedants might not have liked uh, these guys being in their uh, summer dress, but hey. Yeah, um, yeah Austerlitz, I, I, I agree. It's, uh, it's a much more dramatic and just colossal battle. Uh, for me, it's probably the most important in my mind up there with like Leipzig. Leipzig is another one I'd really like to... Um, to model, and I think that would be the the, t the main focus of a of an 1812 sequel. Don't want to get ahead of myself though. But. Yeah, one thing at a time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, w what are people getting, and and what sort of pledges are we talking about? Uh, so uh, you can buy each of the armies individually, in which case you get the aforementioned uh, infantry and command stands, elites, and I also forgot to say that. There's a generic pool of artillery pieces, and each nation have their own crews. So those are what we call the kind of the core STLs. So you can buy either each nation individually or buy them together. Um, above that, there's the option to get the blender files as well, um, which you know, I've already described. But uh, to, to pitch it again, uh, the blender files give you the original assets inside the 3D program with which these models were designed formatted in such a way to make each constituent part of the model easily uh, toggleable or repositioned so that those elements can be copied and put in a fresh file and exported as a new model. Um, I'm providing uh, detailed documentation and YouTube tutorials on how to do that, so it shouldn't be an intimidating process. I also pride myself on being very easy to reach, um, so if people do actually have their individual problems, I'm happy to walk them through. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's essentially it. You just have to decide if you want the uh, the STLs or, or the Blender files. Um, with the STLs, they're just being exported kind of in their sort of default forms, and that's all you get. If you do want to really alter things, then you need the Blender files. And on top of that, uh, under the add-ons, we've got the two expansions I mentioned, uh, the Potential War and the Germanic Miners. And there's also the option to buy uh, any of my previous Kickstarters as add-ons. So if you are interested in the American Civil War, um, that's a way to get it. I will say that's currently the only way to get the Blender files for Union Asunder, which was the American Civil War project. So the only way to get those is as an add-on. And it is at the original price of the original Kickstarter, which is significantly cheaper than buying the STLs separately. I um, think that's everything. Yes, the, the early bird offers all ran out pretty quickly, unfortunately. Uh, some disappointed people there. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. You're offering the ACW one at the Kickstarter prize because um, I'm no particular expert on kickstarters but generally it will be at retail price if if uh, if uh, somebody's offering up back catalog uh product uh, from previous kickstarters it will generally come at retail price so i think that's a really generous offer to um keep the uh, keep the original kickstarter price um i'm looking at the blender now just on on your page and it fascinates me uh so you, it even goes down to which type of facial hair you want on your figure. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about six mil figures here. Yeah, um, the moustaches do print. I've got photographic evidence of that. <laughs> yeah, um, I can see them. But it's the, uh, yeah, they're the only options at the moment. Maybe I should add in some uh, sideburns. I'm thinking about it. Something will be Napoleonic appropriate. Yeah. On the Union Asunder Kickstarter, it went much deeper than that. We had uh, four hairstyles and a well at least like 10 different beards and i think eight mustaches i'm picking that out the top of my head so because they, they were 15 10 15 mils you know obviously you could yeah they, they, that that the focus of that project was about uh having as many individual poses as possible i for example i modeled every step of uh the drill manual so you've got each step of loading a musket there and all wow. the different poses so you could really 
uh, tailor your figures with with these Napoleonic figures. All the infantry are just in marching poses unless they're skirmishers. Yeah. But I do have a guide at the bottom there on how to rotate their heads. I think if I were building an army, that's how I would get some individuality in there. You know, have people looking left, looking right. You obviously want your NCOs looking down the ranks because they're checking that all the buggers are in step. You know. Yes. Um, but yes, uh, other options like in terms of really minor stuff. If you look at the picture on the Kickstarter page of all the different heads, you can actually see the Austrians have the option of whether they want an Edelweiss on their shako or not. Um, and if people have suggestions about uh, other like little details, I could add. I'd be you know happy to do that. Um, with the American Civil War uh project i was constantly getting feedback about little things i could add like glengarry hats um tricorns which i had no idea they wore during that period but one guy got me to add those that's interesting i've, I've never heard of tricorns during the american civil war but there you go oh well i'll tell you what while we're talking i'll see if i can find his facebook message and <laughs> see which regiment it was that apparently wore them right um so what was the lead in time then to the launch of this kickstarter how long have you been developing this range um i think five weeks it's really been the fastest one i've turned around um I, I i promised i'd give him credit so before i forget i want to say i want to give my thanks to uh liam williamson's who is a lovely chap from belgium and he's been very supportive he's been test printing models for me since i got started and uh we were literally just talking one evening and he said like uh, you should do napoleonics uh in six mil it's a cool scale i'm i'm doing it like right now um and i was in one of those moods like i said where i've done my productive work for the day but i still feel too i don't know it's like some kind of personality defect i find it really difficult to just unwind i i have to do use my time productively and uh i just said to him you know what hell i'll try it and i just sculpted i, I sculpted a, the french marching figure like in that one evening in about two and a half hours of just really manic activity because i i'd been practicing here and there like i said just for fun i mess around uh just make make things on the fly and i just made it and said oh that that is quite good and and then i made the full kind of set and just thought oh god <laughs> i've started <laughs> and uh yeah i just frantic frantically got the the core nations done within a week and then the the peninsula and the germanic ones i did the next week and since then it's just been uh troubleshooting test printing because i'm always finding little errors on them uh, even after release, we found that the uh, the free sample models actually had some islands on them, which I'm fixing. Um, your work never really finishes, to be honest. There's always little things you notice that are wrong, including on the ACW miniatures, to be honest. Um, but yes, about, about about three weeks. I'd actually say the most time-consuming part has been uh, the marketing. Um, but what's really interesting about this is that if you were a traditional sculptor, uh, you would sculpt the figure and then create a master mm -hmm. figure and then press a mold and once that molds pressed that you you're committed to it so if you've made an error then that that error is committed in the mold yeah um whereas with your technology it's really a couple of clicks of the button i'm sure it's more than that but it's it's potentially a couple of clicks of a button and you've corrected the file and that is then straight with the customer isn't it uh yeah if if i actually tell the customer unfortunately i have to put my hands up and admit that sometimes i've patched files forgotten to announce it and then i get a message some guys saying hey there's a problem on this model I'm like, oh yeah i fixed that three months ago i just didn't <laughs> but, didn't remind but the, you to download the new one whoops but the potential's there isn't it that yeah. you know as soon as that's that's recognized um i'm looking at uh a, a strip here of six mil austrian fusiliers Mm -hmm. uh, with four figures abreast what sort of uh, frontage are we talking about with those figures on those strips so um i need to say again i wanted to give as many options to people as i could uh when you download the files uh you get each figure on individual round bases yep. just like sorry you get one file of that sculpt and then there's a subfolder which is called strips and battalions and inside there you have uh, pre-exported STL files like the one in the picture of the Mono 4 strip yeah. but you also get uh, Litchi slicer files um, which have the individual models in the file put on a base but still individual and manipulatable if that makes sense yeah. so you could actually base them and go for whatever frontage or scale you want okay. so just because I've 
uh, exported them in, in a given default doesn't mean people are bound to that. But oh, okay. for what I've gone for, I've gone for uh, battalions that are uh, five bases wide. Each base is 20 millimeters wide. Maths again. <laughs> ten, Can't help ten you. millimeters across. Yeah. <laughs> Can't help you, I'm afraid. Uh, but that, that is, I think it's fair to say the 20 mil wide base is, is pretty much the industry standard if you, yeah. if you look at what else is out there in the in the traditional market but um what you're saying is that that is entirely customizable by the people who receive yeah i mean i i'm I, i'm completely open to suggestions on this i mean my, my entire philosophy with regards to approaching a range is to make everything that can be tailorable tailorable so yeah. i give the means to doing that so yeah try to give as many options as i can and again i'll, I'll just stress this point that you've developed a range with four nations initially but up to 13 by the sounds of it um, yeah in, in pretty short order which will then be in the hands well, of a customer fairly quickly post kickstarter i guess uh literally the the moment the uh well I, I need to discuss this with the guys who are doing the fulfillment, my mini factory, but it will either be the moment the project finishes or about two days after when the money changes hands. I'm not really sure which okay. one. Um, but I I do want to say before uh, before you say, oh, I've sculpted 11 nations as quickly, I need to like you know throw my hands up and say that one reason that this has been done so fast is that a lot of the assets are actually shared between the nations. For example, all the men are marching in the same poses. You know, mm. So it's sort of a case of just swapping surface level details between them you know changing hats changing webbing and yeah. things but um but that, that that's the typical process that traditional sculptors go through they will start with essentially the same figure but then customize it with the the surface detail so you know that i don't think that's um uh i don't think that's that that's certainly not unique to this because that is that is how traditional people sculpt no Fair does. I, yeah. And they paint up incredibly well, don't they? I don't know who your painter is, whether it's yourself. Oh, that's me. Um, I, I painted the, the sample models. Uh, there, sorry, there are some that were done by other people. If I've been a good boy, I've hopefully credited them where that's happened. Okay. <laughs> I'm, so. I'm looking Anything at some... on the green mat is me. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at green mat pictures. So I've got Austrian yep. fusiliers in helmet. We've got Prussian uh, fusili uh, musketeers in bicorn, which... Um, and this is... Um, I don't know if this is a confession or not, but um, there's just something about that uniform of the early early Napoleonic period Prussians. I know the army itself performed up shockingly on the battlefield, yeah. but there's just <laughs> something about that uniform that just really resonates with me. Well, let, let, let's be honest. If we're talking aesthetically, one reason why early Napoleonics just trump everything else later is because shackos are boring. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's get it out of there, shall we? Yeah. In, in in this set, what you got Austrians, uh, Austrian fusiliers and helmets, Prussians in cocked hats, French in bicorns, and yeah, the Russians are in shakos, but at least they're sort of individuals in that. Although, having said that, the Prussians do have fusiliers as well, who are wearing very boring stovepipe style shakos. Mm -hmm. I don't particularly like them, but uh, but yes, it, it's it's much more interesting and varied, I think. Whereas if you do if you do late Napoleonics, like all of the allied nations are pretty much in some superficially similar to the Austrian or British style cut of short jacket and a shako, and it just doesn't look as good, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. So uh, I think you set a really modest funding goal of about £250. Yeah, you've Comple completely arbitrary to be honest. You've but. surpassed that. Yes. And we're sitting, as I speak, at eight thousand three hundred and forty-three pounds. That must yeah. that must please you. Um, yeah, I I mean, um, well, <laughs> you know, um, I'm thinking how how open should I be about this? Yeah. Everyone has that conversation where they they start a new project. It'll be with their with their wife, with their girlfriend, or with their parents or something, where they have to explain how what they're doing is a real job, right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Wow. It's moments like this where I, I feel like I can come into those arguments somewhat authoritatively. Um, <laughs> I'm making real money. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've, I'm not particularly materially motivated, but I got, I've got my Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. 
and especially moving from Russia to Britain, where the cost of living is slightly higher, mm. um, I, I'm certainly happy to, to be to be taking some money home. Yeah. Well, I say some. I, I, I shan't be falsely modest. It is it is a good amount. Yes, I'm I'm very pleased with it. And listen, I don't think you need to be shy about that because this isn't a, a philanthropic venture. This is no. this is a business, isn't it? Um, I'm just looking at uh, another bit of the Kickstarter here, and it tells me, for instance. Uh, and this is no surprise that the French army STLs are uh, there's, there's far more involved in the French army STLs, um, and it's, it says it includes French army 1792 to 1812 generic gun set, base and movement trace set, and then nameplate exporter. What's that about? Nameplate oh, uh, let's see if there's a screenshot of that. I think there is. Duk, 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 duk. Uh, just looking on the page myself as well. Uh, oh, the nameplates. It's it's going to be a very niche thing. I think most people won't go in for it. I've just included it because it wasn't so much effort. Um, I have uh, two two types of movement tray included. Oh, they're not pictured, but they are in the trailer. Toward okay. the end of the trailer, there's a yeah. screenshot of it. Um, I've got two types of a uh, battalion movement tray. Uh, some that are just you know ordinary rectangles, and then a second version that has a little slot that you can put in a resin printed nameplate. Uh, uh on and the nameplate consists of the name of your unit and a little embossed flag that you can paint up oh that's fantastic and the exporter means on blender you can just type in the name and export it so you can put in your own name for a regiment so could you possibly um put a numerical value on there that might be relevant to the rules you're using um i, I just need to ask you to explain you can type numbers on there certainly uh, so i'm thinking of a, a very popular rule set like Blucher, which is a, a grand tactical uh, sized game where a unit is uh, on one base and you'll have the name of the unit at the back of the base with the uh, the strength if you like so it might be a, a number like uh, six yeah. or four or something that represents the strength of that particular base yeah yeah you can you can put a number on there certainly yeah uh, it, literally it's it's like typing in something on Microsoft Word or whatever, you just type in what you want and uh, press tab. So it's entirely customizable within yeah. the... Yeah. It, it's, it's another Blender file, funnily enough. Yeah, <laughs> it all comes back to the Blender files. Yes, and and again, I, I mean, uh, hopefully I might address this properly uh, at the end in our last part of the conversation. Yeah. But, um, it, it seems so intimidating on the surface, and I've, I've been there myself. Um, you don't need to go through what I went through with regards to teaching myself how to use a whole program. Yeah. I have instructions in the file and I will walk everyone through. It's it's not so intimidating. But at the same time, there is a kind of, I can't call it a mysticism, but this this reverence with which we approach people that, that design files and that, you know, when you're not used to that and that's an uncomfortable environment for you, it, it, it's sort of undue just because as with anything, there's not really any particular magic to it. It's just a case of investing time and having that willingness to work at it because yeah. I, I, I had no formal education. I literally watched one uh, YouTube series. If, if you're interested in Blender, by the way, guys, it's uh, the Just Look Up Blender Donut Tutorial. I completed that and uh, got some advice from Simon Mann and then otherwise it was just completely trial and error. Like it's not it's not a particularly scary program. It's just the unknown to begin with, of course. And yeah. we're always scared of that. But but little touches like that, uh, Henry, I think are really attractive um, because ordinarily for a game like Blucher, um, people will uh, print out a label or, or handwrite the, the name of the unit and the, the strength value uh, or the, the sort of um, fatigue level of, of the unit. But you can actually have bespoke printed nameplates with the values on it. And I think that would look incredible. Um, well, I, yeah, I, I first made them for ships, actually. Uh, right. So that on the, you know, you've got your nice water texture base. And on the back, you've got this label with gold text saying, you know, HMS Mordaunt or whatever. Yeah. Little flag. And I just thought, oh, why not stick them on the infantry as well? So, so um, what, what date did you launch? uh the 20 the, yeah 27th wasn't it 27th yes. so three days ago yeah crikey and you've got oh, yeah. 17 days to go 
and you're already at eighteen thousand. Uh, sorry, eight thousand pounds. Hopefully, you get to eighteen thousand pounds. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we get to twenty five. If not for the money, <laughs> then just because I want, I want to sculpt that brig. Yeah, yeah. So uh, anybody who pledges to Kickstarter, uh, well, certainly I do. I always go straight to the stretch goals and look what uh, stretch goals are on offer and uh, how close we are to funding them. So. Um, What's the next stretch goal that is due to be unlocked? So I'm, I'm glad I have a chance to explain this because I've, I've done something very confusing by Kickstarter standards and that there are actually three separate um, progressions for the stretch goals because <laughs> I've got a series, one for the core set and one for each of the expansions. Yeah. So our next stretch goal for the core set is great coat wearing infantry sculpts. <gasps> so I misspoke earlier when I said we'd already funded that. I thought we had. You're um, not far off though, by the way. No. So, so if you want to do Austerlitz, you need to get that funded quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for the Peninsula Wall, we've got Highlanders coming up next. That's at 8,500. So yeah, that's 157 quick to go for that one. I think people will be quite keen on Highlanders. Um, I'm going to do them with kilts, and uh, I've got two hat options there. Um, just reminding myself what the names were, because I didn't know this. Oh, I haven't written it down. One's a bonnet, and the other's like a Kilnarnik hat or something. I'll take your word for that, don't I? Oh, okay. I thought it might be your area. To... No, no, Napoleonic is, is a little bit of a uh, dark period for me. A oh. bit of a dark ages for me. But, so. And we've got Swedish Lifeguard as the next for the Germanic okay. Miners. And... Uh, if if I can get all tantalizing with the, the ultimate goals for each one. Um the the last one for Peninsula is the is the brig I mentioned. I want to do a six millimeter scale brig with crew figures and launches. Yeah. Which is why it's so far down, because I it's it's like a project in itself. Yeah. Uh, for the core set we've got French camp followers, which I just thought would be a nice sort of scenic collectible piece perhaps. Um and for the Germanic miners it's it's adding Denmark. And then sort of separately under the stretch goals, uh they're not they're not stretch goals in that you won't get them for free. It's just sort of how I'll gauge how successful the project is. I've said that if we raise ten thousand, I will make a cavalry themed sequel. Yeah. Because you know those of you listening closely might have noticed I haven't mentioned cavalry so far. It was my next question, Henry. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, I think I can answer why they're not included by default uh, by just doing the following. Uh, let's try list off the top of our heads how many types of Napoleonic cavalry there are. Um, <laughs> we got chasseurs, carabiniers, cuirassiers, uh, hussars, uhlans, cossacks, um, Dragoon. guard, cavalry, lancers, Dragoons. suffice to say. Dragoons, yes. Um, I th- Chasseur I think cheval. Yes, yes. <laughs> suffice to say, if you're if you're doing all those, I mean, obviously some of them are unique. A lot of them are just unique to the French. But yes. if you're doing those for um, 13 separate nations, you know what? I'm lying because Poland's there as well. I've got Poland as one of the French stretch goals. Oh, bollocks. So, yeah, <laughs> 14 different nations. Um, that's basically a Kickstarter in of itself. And I wasn't really willing to, to commit myself to all that for a, yeah, a project that I couldn't be certain about the success of. So I yeah. said, all right, if it raises 10K, I'll do a mini Kickstarter sequel. Um I hope people won't begrudge me that. I'm sure there might be some, but I, yeah, it would have been too much to bite off and chew otherwise because the, the uniforms, especially on cavalry, are just so damn ornate. Yeah, um, they are. They are. Particularly when you get into the guard uh, type cavalry for uh, yeah. the French, but um, I'm, I'm guessing only two or three weeks' work, right? <laughs> oh, dear. I shouldn't have said that now. It's going to be setting the new standard, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, if, if you put it out there, you've got to, you've got to come up with the goods. <laughs> And this one, this is the most self-interested goal. I've said if we raise 20k, I will do uh, an Ottoman-themed Kickstarter for the wow. Egyptian campaign. Wow. Simply because for years now, I've wanted to make a custom risk board themed around Europe. Oh, okay. And uh, I need Ottoman figures if I do it. So I'll yeah. be like, all right. Camels. To make it. camels. <laughs> yeah. There's not enough camels in Napoleonics at the moment. The drum, oh, is there a gap for camels? Sorry? Okay. Cam- there's a gap in the market for camels? There's got to be, hasn't there? Surely, to oh. goodness. Oh, good. I, good. I can't think of a six mil manufacturer that makes uh, the Napoleonic, was it the Dromedary Corps or something like that? The, uh, the oh, camels. you should be careful. We're late in the evening now. I'm at my impulsive stage. I mean, <laughs> Are you in the creative phase? That's the point. Yeah, I might go hammer away a camel if yeah, we don't like There you go. Um, okay, so, I mean, that's 
that's pretty exciting, I think, because certainly if um, in what seventeen days left on the campaign, let's say let's say four weeks' time, let's give you some grace. These files for all of this infantry could be in the hands of your well, eager yeah. customers. Uh, I, I've got this. I've got this in writing, so I'm happy to commit to it. I've already written it down, but. Uh... At the moment of release, everyone will receive the the core files there and then. Either the moment funding finishes or the moment the money is actually transferred. I need to, like I said, confirm that with yeah. my mini factory. But uh, with the uh, with the two add-ons, I've committed to within two weeks of launch delivering uh, the Germanic miners, and within four weeks the Peninsula. Yeah. Um, I would ordinarily say I'm I, I will try and get it all done at launch, but uh, right now. I'm spending 100% of my work just rounding off the ACW stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't. I'm not working on Napoleonics at the moment, just because the core set's already finished. But but purely out of self-interest, if I was wanting to make a start on uh, an Austerlitz collection, sure. Then I'm I'm going to be able to make a pretty good start uh, from day one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you, yeah. If you go for one of the four core nations, there certainly. And and uh, you can only paint one thing at a time, so it gives you plenty of time to get me the cavalry, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think war gamers um, can tend to fall into that category where they want everything now, but the realization is that if you give them everything now, they're not going to paint everything now. It's well, going to be another six months down the road before they'll move on to uh, a different if, nation or a different arm of the uh, the service. If if I can give another shout out, it has to be just to say that in general, most people have just been so kind of benevolent to be honest like in a way i really didn't expect because when i have made mistakes in the past like the aforementioned issue with i released the acw range and within a week realize every model is incorrect i have to redo everything right. hectically with lots of apologies um people were just so kind and understanding and when in the past i've had to announce delays or explain issues or mistakes people always say oh i have so much to paint already or oh you're doing a good job oh you beat yourself up too much mm. and um, yeah, I, I really didn't expect that because I, I guess, um, I guess like we might have a negative image based on a sort of really vocal minority of, um, again, I'll use the word grognards, you know, um, yeah. the, 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 the people can, can always find something to be unhappy about, but mm. almost without exception, I, I don't really think I've had any bad experiences with, with people yet who back the projects actually really, uh, tearing me into one for something. So yeah, generally people have been really, really great, very, really fantastic. Uh, very, very supportive guys uh, on the community group. It's a nice community there. Um, just generally, people only have nice things to say. It's, it's, it's really good. It's really helpful. It's, it, it gets you feeling very motivated to work hard. And um, yeah, I, it feels really cliche to say I want to thank the fans, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do. Like I, I couldn't couldn't get anywhere without. Uh, you know, when you log on Facebook every day and see some nice messages there, it's really nice. Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head when you talk about a vocal minority. I think the vast majority of people um, want people like yourself to succeed uh, because they want the product. And if this is a, a product that um, they're intrigued by, then they want the product to succeed and want you to succeed and encourage you to be creating uh, far more product for us. Uh, to be to be buying and uh, selling our souls to uh, get into. So um, uh, absolutely, uh, I, you know, I'm going to be wishing you every success with this. And every time I speak to somebody who's producing these STL files and and creating uh, this product, then I'm, I can feel myself inching closer and closer to uh, falling down the rabbit hole of uh, 3D printing. but Well, that may well be the format for the next section. I have to sell it to you personally. Right. <laughs> well, speaking of which then, so um, is there, uh, regarding this campaign, is there anything else that you would like to get out there to the listener? Oh, all right. Uh, let, let me think. Um, I'll just do it in a recap form by the point then. Um, let's say fairly comprehensive range cheapest chips to, to print them all off, uh, quite wide spanning, good scope for stretch goals, um, and an openness to, to cover more in the future. I think after the cavalry are done and potentially the Ottomans, I will come back and do a, an 1813 themed one, like sort of loosely theme it around Leipzig, but add in some other nations too, you know, uh, post in French and uh, 
the United States as well, I'd like to do. Although, I don't know, I've heard their uniforms so similar to the British cut that it might well be possible just to export them out of Blender using the existing assets. Yeah. Sorry, rambling. Um, yeah, just modularity and, and a wide scope. Um, and hopefully everything that you need to, if you've never even got into Napoleonics before, everything you need just to, to print and go. Um, and I have all the sliced files included with them. So potentially, if you're willing to just go with my default parameters for how I've arranged a battalion, you could literally just plug it in and get printing within like five minutes of receiving the files. Yeah. There's no supports required for these models. Um, it's just ready to go as simple as possible. Uh, yeah, I guess that is the, the basic pitch of it. Just and uh, if you like the American Civil War, feel free to add uh, Yumi Asunder onto your pledges as well. Uh, that's very much a similar approach to this. They're not supportless, but they have even more customization potential. Um, I got called arrogant at the time, but I tried to say that I was including everything in the Blender files for that to cover the entire scope of the Civil War, all the possible hat and garment options one would need. Apart from a haversack. No, <laughs> not on launch. No. Just, just before we do move on um, to the next section, then, Henry, there's just one thing I, I've just forgotten to talk about, which is the scalability of the yeah. sculpts. Now, I, I know you said if you scale up to uh, certainly up to 28 mil, they might look like chunky monkeys, but the 10 mil uh, version of them certainly looks uh, more than acceptable. They look quite beautiful. Yeah. I think I think what might uh, be problematic is just the limitation of poses, yeah. um, because all your infantry will be stuck marching. If that's yeah. not an issue for you, then yeah, definitely go up to 50 mil with them. Yeah. I think uh, if I have my choice, like I mean, if I find a local gaming group and they're not doing the pony so I get the chance to sell it to them or whatever, I would go for 10 mil myself. Yeah. Um, I think that probably is the best compromise scale. But yes, these will scale up to 50 mil. You're on mil a quite. six mil podcast now, Henry. Yeah, I'm a, with a with a host who's admitted that he's uh, had flirtations with fifteen men. <laughs> too guilty. Yeah, we're absolutely open to uh, all scales here. It's it's uh, it's absolutely true. And uh, uh, ours is a tolerant God, right? <laughs> absolutely, yeah. It's a broad church. Um, uh, but no, they, they uh, and I think in ten mil, you you're right. You've got that perfect compromise, and the poses I think matter less. They, they matter more the, the larger the figure, certainly. Yeah. Uh, certainly sure. if you get looking at skirmish gaming. But for the mass battle games that these 6 mil and 10 mil sculpts would be designed for, they're absolutely perfect. If I might ask you a question, given that I've never, I had never touched 6 mil models before this, to be yeah. honest. Um, 15 with, no, well, a few 10 mils, but I'd never gone lower than that. Um, when painting these, at least with contrast paints, you can see um, I have painting tutorials for, for these models up on the YouTube channel, and I think some are linked on the Kickstarter too. Um, when I was painting these with, with uh, Games Workshop contrast paints, I actually found the effort required was almost as much as a 15 mil. I'd gone into 6 mil because I'd heard all these uh, stories about how you can just paint a whole army in an evening or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I found it just as time consuming. I, is that like some trick because if if it doesn't have that usp of being quick to paint then yeah i'd definitely go to 10 mil just because i don't think it'd be a different workload on the painting side yeah so the mantra and this isn't my mantra i'm, I'm pinching this from peter berry at bacchus it is to paint the unit and not the man so you need to fuss less with six mil than you do with the larger scales um, there's almost an impressionistic approach that you need to take so uh, where you've painted um, the piping around the cuffs of these figures, uh, I, I don't know if that's the 10 mil or the 6 mil, actually. Just let me uh, scroll up uh, as I chat. But um, 6 mil, you can certainly get away with uh, less. Less is more on 6 mil. Um, and there's, listen, there's, there's a, a million different ways of painting a 6 mil figure. Um, and you've done a, a fantastic job of these. But if I was to put the effort in to paint my six mil figures to the manner that you, uh, to the style that you painted these, it would drive me nuts. As a display piece to show off the sculpt, it's great. But you would never paint, well, personally, um, I would never paint an army to the standard that you've painted uh, these. Well, I think 
I think next time I'll try the black undercoat and the dry brushing on top method and see if how that works out because that's what a lot of people have been saying to me. Yeah, these were these were white undercoats working down with contrast paints yeah. from the lightest hue to the darkest ones. It, yeah, it took forever. It took me about four days to do all these sample yeah. battalions. Well, with a black undercoat, black undercoat's great. Um, there's a, a follower of this show named Per Broden who is well known in the six mil community for creating absolutely ginormous great northern war battles so we're talking very early 18th century uh, sweden versus russia plus uh, a couple of the german states uh, he's swede he's uh, swedish himself so he knows this history very well um and he he would have an approach where he'd, he'd spray the figure white uh, or a gray color actually and then put a black wash over it to show the detail and then rather than dry brush, you sort of, it's about blobs and lines is the best way to describe it. So rather than dry brushing, for instance, on the arm of your Prussian musketeer, uh, one, one line down the arm, on the outside of the arm, would show the blue of, uh, of the jacket. And the bit in between the inner arm and the body would remain in sort of black or a very dark gray. And would just at gaming distance at three foot away would just look like shadow. So mm. you've blown these figures up to um, uh, what am I looking at there? Sort of over an inch on my screen, the picture is of a figure that's six mil. Now we're going to be looking at these figures from three, four, five feet away sometimes. And you're not going to be interested in the piping around the, uh, the, the, uh, the cuff of the figure. Or sometimes even the straps or the belts or the piping on the bike horn. So there's a very much impressionistic uh, approach that six mil painters, certainly people who paint large amounts of six mil and, and paint thousands and thousands of these figures, you would drive well, yourself you would drive yourself nuts painting well, that standard. If you don't mind my using a 40k analogy, this is something I used to say. There are two types of 40k painter those that paint the insides of their rhinos and those that don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, that's in a similar vein. And I think the certainly the attraction for the majority of people that play in six mil, it's about using thousands of figures on a table yeah. and fighting the big battles of history on uh, a, 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 in a smaller space than you would if you're playing in 28 mil. I can absolutely see the appeal. I mean, I, I see 28 mil Napoleonics, and unless you're doing some kind of loose order skirmish game, it just looks sort of silly to me. It, it, it can do. Um, follower of this podcast, Mr. Ken Riley, the Yorkshire gamer, uh, he he plays on a 20-foot table with thousands of Napoleonic figures but that's in 28 mil. But that's a collection that he's built up over years. Yeah. Whereas personally, if I was to do Austerlitz, say, uh, using a rule set like Blucher, which is a very popular grand tactical rule set, and a, you might want to have a look at that. And, and there's a scenario for Austerlitz for Blucher that I'm now thinking about uh, as as a potential project. Um, then you need uh, maybe uh, 20, 30 figures per brigade. Uh, you'd be looking at two, 3,000 sculpts uh, on the on the table, I would suggest, which oh, you're yeah. telling me I, I can do for about ninety eight pence by the sounds of it. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, I exaggerate, but um, the 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 cost benefit of uh, of uh, the three D printing process sounds absolutely well. Um, I think this will sort of lead us into the whole pitching three D printing as a medium thing. Yeah. But uh, on my Elegoo Mars Two Pro, which I would highly recommend, entry level machine. Um, I figured out, uh, one, one guy asked this, so I tried to see how many models I could physically cram on the build plate. I was able to fit as a sort of maximum eight battalions. Um, one thing that people should know about resin printing, because I get asked, how many will it take to, uh, how long will it take to print this many models? Um, where FDM printing and resin printing are different, and I appreciate we should probably define what those machines are, but uh, now I've started, I will finish. Uh, with, a, with a resin printer, it's, it's printing everything on the plate layer by layer, but everything is being printed at once. So the number of models on the plate does has no effect on the printing time. So you're incentivized to fit as many as you possibly can. 
Um, but let's say eight battalions. Uh, what did we, how many did we say was in a battalion? It was 40 figures, wasn't it? Yeah. So 40 times eight people that can do maths can do that for us. Um, they will print it on my machine. It's about two hours and uh, 50 minutes. Right. You can have eight battalions ready. And uh, yeah, the cost will be about a pound, maybe a bit over resin wise. Um, there are some hidden costs to 3D printing, like depending on which resin you're using, uh, you might need alcohol to clean your prints. And obviously there's electricity as opposed to factoring. Mm -hmm. I don't pay the bills here. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, certainly a very cheap means of production. Yeah. Well, let's segue right into that discussion then that we stuck a pin in um, yeah. at the start of the chat, because that is certainly from my perspective a huge benefit of the, this technology but for somebody like me who would classify himself as a grognard i'm not a button counter but i'm a, of an age where i would be within the grognards uh within the imperial guard in fact i'd, I'd be due retirement and a pension now but um <laughs> t talk to me then about the learning aspect the the uh sort of making that leap if you like crossing the rubicon and and, and jumping into this technology which does seem like black magic to me okay i'm, I'm gonna do my best not to waffle because i appreciate we've gone on for all the 90 minutes no 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 listen <laughs> we we've got all the time in the world henry don't you worry about that okay um Right. Well, I think before I get started, I should explain, because I was using the term so freely, I should say what the difference is between FDM printing and resin printing. Yeah. Um, an FDM printer is probably what you think of when you imagine a 3D printer. It's an armature with a little nozzle on it that's spitting the plastic out and sort of whizzing back and forth, um, sort of pooping a stream of plastic to shape something. Um, they are very fiddly machines that require a lot of... Um, trial and error, uh, they're, they're a bit temperamental, but not particularly intimidating because they don't produce any nasty fumes and no mess because the plastic just immediately cures. Oh, sorry, it's not plastic, F filament. I'm, I'm going to be annoying someone, I'm getting something wrong, but the material uh, solidifies immediately and uh, it's non-toxic, so it's often touted as a very beginner-friendly printer, though that's contentious. However, for these models, I wouldn't recommend one because although you can calibrate them, you can buy special nozzle parts and things to do fine details, you'll never get it to print 6 mil, maybe 10 mil, 15 mil. Um, but you, it's physically having to print each figure, like moving the armature up and down, carving it out. Whereas a resin printer uh, works using um, an LCD screen that's at the bottom of a vat of resin that has a clear bottom and it's there, there's a plate which moves down just onto the top of this tank and the lcd screen um shines a projection of uv light in a given shape to make one layer cure in that shape and then the plate retracts by uh, in the case of if you're printing six mil it will retract by uh, 0 0.02 millimeters so mm -hmm. there's about 1100 layers uh in uh, one of these six mil figures wow so this plate is moving up and moving back, moving up and moving back, layer by layer, on the new screens. And when you, if you if you buy a resin printer, it's very important to make sure it has one of these new screens. They're called mono screens. Uh, a mono screen only needs about two seconds per layer, so it will shine the light for two seconds. The resin cures, uh, plate retracts, then comes back down. Um, resin printers have a bit more of a bad rep. They're very intimidating. But one thing I would say for anyone who's researching 3D printing and comes across uh, lots of threads about problems or how it doesn't work, remember there's a kind of mantra that's true about lots of technologies, which is generally the people who aren't having problems aren't singing from the rooftops about it, you know? Yeah. If, if I'm going to take the effort to go on the internet and post about my machine, it's usually because there's a problem with it. Most people, I feel confident saying, uh, get along with their resin printers fine after a few initial hiccups. In, in my case, the worst thing I've done uh, was I actually ruptured the film on the bottom and had the resin leak all over my printer. So okay. some, yeah, some stuff can go wrong. Was that um, fatal to the printing machine? No, 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 no. no. I, I noticed it. I got it all cleaned off. It was fine. Um, what makes resin printing attractive to people, though, in general, is the perception that resin itself is toxic. 
Um, this is true, you shouldn't be touching it with your bare hands, but if you actually spend the money on good quality stuff, it isn't so pungent. Um, I feel quite comfortable having it open uh, in a room with me. What stinks much worse is the alcohol that I use to clean it. However, you can also buy water washable resin. Um, so whereas most resins require that when the model is printed, it be immersed in 99% uh, strength IPA, uh, ideally with a proper cleaning machine, we'll get onto that in a second, um, you, you, you wash all of the non-cured resin off. So, you know, the, the model's safe to touch and uh, you don't get uncured resin curing in sunlight and then covering up all your details. But you can actually get water washable resin, which will just wash off in water. Um, although apparently it is more pungent. But again, just buy good grade stuff. Generally, the people that are having problems with horrible fumes and headaches are buying like a, I don't know, like a 10 quid Chinese bottle. I mean, well, it's all Chinese ultimately, but you know what I mean. Yes. They buy the they buy the cheaper stuff that, and uh, they pay for it in, in different ways. Um, I mentioned a, a washing station. And I'm sorry if I'm rambling. No, this no. could be a bit more structured. This but, is what uh, we want. <laughs> if you're going to buy a resin printer and you have the money spare, I really emphatically recommend looking up the Elegoo Wash and Cure station. I recently got one myself and it just sort of demolished most of the anxieties I have on printing. Um, for my last Kickstarter, the last Age of Sale one, I had to print uh, some 130 ships for physical order fulfillment because I actually offered physical products. And it was so stressful because my old cleaning cycle, I, I was working in a small bedroom in London where the printer was literally next to my bed. Um, my cleaning cycle was just to open up a Tupperware tub and like flick the models into alcohol just floating in that tub and just leave them there suspended. And as the alcohol got dirty, um, the models would get coated in uncured resin even when they were taken out. It was a really messy setup. I splashed things places, anything I touched became sticky. If you have this um, wash and cure station, you remove the build plate from your printer and put it right in the wash and cure station. And it's immersed in the alcohol and there's like, um, I don't really know what you call it, a swirly thing at the bottom that makes the alcohol stir around. Um, you actually at no point need to come into physical contact with uncured resin. And when you remove it, um, the build plate, everything has just been cleaned bare. And the quality of life improvement is just, like, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And that's how I printed these sample six mils. I put them in that machine. And then I had a plastic tub ready with hot water in it, dipped the little plate in there, and then just used a knife to very gently remove the strips. Because once the resin's heated, it's it's rather pliable and you can just sort of bend it off the plate. Um, and then it's just really nothing to stress about. And the reason why I said it might be a bit contentious to say that FDM printers are more beginner friendly is that once you kind of have your swing with resin, it's very reliable. Once you've got the plate leveled and your uh, the film on the bottom of your vats properly secured and you've got your settings figured out uh which you know i'm happy just to share uh, share my settings uh, if it applies to your machine um you can literally just plug it in and let it go whereas fdm lots of stuff can go wrong because it's relying on a physical armature actually moving up and down the model um so yeah i'm sorry if uh that was a bit of a long-winded explanation but i i would say if you're gonna print off six mils you need a resin printer uh, because they're just so much more detailed. As I said, the layer height is 0 0.02 millimeters. Um, FDM is, is much more matte. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. I'm much more experienced with resin printing than FDM printing. And the resolutions of the screens are so detailed. That's how you get these really fine details. Like if you look at the six mil figures, you actually see that they have noses and mouths and eyes, um, which I'm not really sure you actually see on metal figures. Uh, that's just because each detail on these models is is sculpted by an individual pixel on a screen and uh yeah so okay so uh, you've mentioned the elegoo wash and cure station mm -hmm. what uh, uh, and you're recommending that what what printer would you recommend oh uh sorry i, I, I mentioned it earlier but i should have reiterated uh, i personally use an elegoo mars 2 pro um I've only ever had an Elegoo Mars 2 and an Elegoo Mars 2 Pro, so I can't comment on the other stuff. As far as I understand, any Cubic machines are generally the same sort of specs. To be honest, I have a suspicion that these Chinese companies are just buying the same uh, excess uh, parts because the, the screen, for example, in the Elegoo is just a normal LCD screen you can just buy separately um, anyway, but whatever. It's not really relevant. But I've heard that any Cubics... Um, customer care isn't as good as Elegoo's. Right. Um, 
I, I've had no complaints from my machine. I can't say it's the best on the market, but it just works for me. I know that there are some 4K screen ones that are even better details. Um, I cannot off the top of my head remember, but one of my uh, one of my customers, Eric Brown, I think, has a 4K machine, which he was able to print the Union Asunder figs, which were intended for 15 mil. He was able to print them in 6 mil because his machine is just so precise with it. Yeah. But for cheap and cheerful, and it definitely works, I would say the Elegoo Mars 2 Pro is what I'm using. And like I said, you can print uh, print six mil figures in under three hours with that. And uh, you mentioned a new mono screen. Yeah. So is, is, does that come included with the uh, Elegoo? Mars yes, uh, that will be in the Elegoo Mars 2 Pro. And generally any printer that has it will have mono in the title somewhere right. or with the description. Uh, the old generation, I, I don't know what the names of the older screens they use, but the old generation would take more than twice as long to print things. Yeah. So uh, it's really worth getting one. One thing that does have to be said, though, uh, and this is a disadvantage of resin printing, the screens have to be considered a sort of a disposable product. If you're printing frequently, you're replacing them about every six months. Okay. Uh, I've had my printer for nine months, but I don't run it very often. Um, so I haven't had to replace my screen yet. But it's inevitable that you, you will have to change that. Uh, I have one spare screen that I bought off um, AliExpress, which I, I have to hand for the day when I finally do have to change it. But uh, that's something that I'm still quite anxious about because I've never had to do it before. Um, the other disposable part that you might have to change is the FEP screen, like I mentioned. Um, beginner's tip, I guess, because I learned this the hard way. When you print something, uh, always check the bills plate to visually inspect that nothing has fallen off. Because if you don't notice and then you remount the plate and print something, that plate will come down to 0.02 millimeters above your thin plastic screen at the bottom of the vat. And if there's a physical object already in the vat, it will just push it right through the, uh, the film. And that's how I leaked resin all over my machine. Before. <laughs> okay. um, and I, I guess one of the most pertinent questions I, I can ask you is cost. So mm -hmm. um, you, you, talked, you talk about the, the two machines that you've got, the, the, the wash station and the machine and then the fact that you need to consider the screens as um having a, a, a definite shelf life so what's what sort of and what, what sort of cost if i was to go out well you're tomorrow, what, you're you're very lucky here in that i i so often find myself trying to convince people to take up resin printing that i sort of know the amazon prices off by heart so <laughs> okay good for me you can get an elegoo mars 2 pro for about 240 pounds on yep. amazon um, the wash and cure station is 110 pounds. Uh, you'll want IPA alcohol if you're not using water washable resin. Um, you can get a bottle of that again off Amazon. A 1.5 litre bottle, I think, is eight pounds fifty. If you're using water washable resin, you can get uh, Elegoo water washable re resin for 44 pounds. But I use Nova 3D conventional resin, so I do need alcohol, um, and that's 37 pounds. I've not tried water washable resin. I've heard it's fine, but, but has problems with larger prints. But if you're doing six mil, of course, you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, for uh, your other consumables, though, FEP screens, you can buy five of those for um, 20 quid. Your machine will have one already installed on it. And if you're careful, you hopefully won't break it. But you still, it's just common sense to have spares on hand. Uh, and a new uh, screen is uh, 60 quid. So I don't know. I wasn't counting as I went along. It's it's somewhere around about four hundred pounds, I think. Then um, maybe just a, a touch over. Um, yeah, for, but, for uh, obviously you don't need to buy the screen from the get go because yeah. your first one should last you six months. Yes. So. Yeah. Okay. So just under. Um, yeah. But if you want to spare, uh, just in case, are you clumsy? So there, there's a little bit of a an outlay initially, but um, I'm guessing the uh, resin that you're buying for £37 will last for some time, particularly if you're printing six more figures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know the exact amounts off my head, but when I fill my vat up like to its maximum level, uh, the other day I ran uh, like five consecutive full six mil plate prints and uh, the level went down by about a, like a centimetre and the whole thing is about seven centimeters deep and i think i can fill it up about four times at one bottle okay so it, yeah. it's it's marginal cost then isn't it that we're talking about yeah uh, yeah I, I mean um any 
any slicer, slicers being the programs that prepare files for 3D printing, uh, any slicer can tell you how much money you'll spend because you put in how much your bottle costs and how much is in the bottle, and it can tell you the material cost of what you're printing. Yeah. And that's how I, I'm able to say stuff like under a quid for the um, for the five eight battalions. Yeah, five. Sorry, around a quid for eight, and a, a definitely under for five. Yeah. It's about ATP for five. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about then the impact this technology is going to have on the industry. Um, because wargaming for forever has been cottage cottage industry essentially, where mm -hmm. very talented people will sit down with some milliput and a bit of wire and a sculpting tool and will will create these figures um, on a, on a uh, one to one scale. Um, and then press it into a mold, cast them, cast the figures out of the mold, and uh, and produce the little lead figures. I'll, I'll leave plastic aside for the moment, but um, it's quite a labour-intensive uh, process for the, the traditional figure manufacturer. But we're talking now about the possibility, or the reality, actually, sorry, where the wargamer can print off as many figures as he or she wants in their their bedrooms for absolutely minimal cost by the sounds of it yeah so w what is your estimate then of where we will be in five ten years time within the, this industry well i think uh first of all 3d printing has a lot to do uh or at least proponents of 3d printing have a lot to do about the the optics of the medium um because i think a lot of people who think um, this might be a bit outdated by now. I think finally perception sort of catching up. But for the longest time, a lot of people, when they heard 3D printing, were thinking about those really early, like eight, ten-year-old images we saw of FDM printed 40k armies. I don't know. Do you remember like th these images that were doing the rounds of like Space Marine dreadnoughts? Yes, that absolutely. Had these yeah. really sketchy lines running across them. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, there are still people who kind of think of it that way. And and if you get in. Particularly, and I'm I'm sorry I keep bringing up 40k. I'm not particularly a fan. It's just you know on Facebook it's it's quite a dominant. I'm in lots of war gaming groups, so you're always seeing uh, 40k conversations. But well, let's but, face it, it's it is the most dominant game in the industry, isn't it? So yeah, so yeah, it's relevant to talk about it. But uh, 3D printing is obviously a very pressing thing there, I guess, because uh, the community doesn't have the warmest feelings towards Games Workshop yeah. and. Um, when 3D printing is uh, brought up, there are lots of people that will say 3D printing can never compete with the level of details that you see on like uh, official products, let's say. Um, that's sort of just patently false now, especially when we're at the point where a lot of companies are actually using 3D printed masters to make their molds. Yeah. Um, I, I know you, you were describing the artisanal approach there of um, hand sculpting, but he, he, I'm not, I'm not going to you know, name, name specifically, but there are in six mil companies that uh, 3D print their masters. Um, so it's already kind of the industry standard. Yeah. Um, so that's the first problem is people perceive it as being of inferior quality. I can just say that's patently false. You do see um, artifacts on some models. I mean, like on mine, because mine are printed standing up, you can see on like a, any kind of curved surfaces, like the figures' backs, you can see what kind of look like fingerprints on the backs. Um, stuff like that's just fixed by angling and were these like larger scale more detailed models I would say use supports and tilt them at like 45 degrees and then those kind of problems uh, don't manifest so much so uh, the supporting and how you print is very much an art in of itself and you know there are a lot of people that say uh, 3D printing is its kind of own hobby and that's true because there's so many little calibrations and you know, little bits of tinkering you can do but okay so if problem one is optics problem two is people being intimidated to enter in like i was saying because the most sort of vocal conversations had about the physical machines themselves are usually leaning negative because it's it's started by people who are having problems um but it is at a point now where although i can't quite say it's a it's a plug and play technology there is going to be a learning curve it, it's at a point where it's more reliable than it's ever been and the cost factor isn't really in your way anymore. If you were really trying to budget and you had some kind of uh, tolerance for um, a few failures here and there, all you really need is like your printer, your first bottle of resin, 
eight quid bit of alcohol and a Tupperware tub and you could get going. Oh, gloves. We didn't mention gloves. Wear gloves, guys. Sorry. People will get very mad with me if I forget to say wear gloves. Get some nitrile gloves. But if you've got your gloves and your alcohol and your Tupperware tub and your printer, you, you, you can get going there. And that's that's under 300. Yeah. Curing your models with the sun. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's not as high a barrier to entry. And... Uh, yeah, I, I think that's where things first have to change is when, when people change their perception of the medium, first in terms of quality and how accessible it is, <clears throat> we'll see it adopted more and more. And just every day I see people mentioning that they're, they're getting started, they've just got a printer or they're thinking about it. Like it, it is steadily growing. So from there, when we actually get to the point where, and I, I think the critical moment will be when a 3D printer is just considered like a mandatory bit of kit for a war gamer, you know, the same as how every war gamer should have some paint and glue. Mm. 3D printer as well. I think the change that we'll we'll need to see is uh, model companies moving over to actually just selling STL files. Yeah. Um, of course, I think there'll always be a place for like lead. Do we call them lead? I don't know. Should I say lead miniatures? It, it's it's the traditional like term, company. isn't yeah. it? But it, it's metal alloy, isn't it? Essentially. Yeah. Uh, pewter to quote games workshop yes. um, Yeah. There's always going to be a place for that because you know you, you can't really substitute how they feel. Although there are now metal 3D printers, but you know I've I've never touched one. I have oh, no idea what they're like. But did not know that. Print, you could 3D print in metal now. Oh god. Okay. Um, I think I think that it will uh, take over in that way. But where I personally want to see change is in the attitudes of designers themselves, because. And I'm going to get a little combative here, but we're we're like two hours in, so only the only the really interested and dedicated will still be listening by now. Exactly. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm not going to rustle any jimmies. But a lot of designers are just utterly unimaginative in how they're approaching this medium. Um, and what I'm going to use as my case study is if you go on like my mini factory, so many manufacturers there are making monoposed D and D sets wherein. Every month they just release a set of, you know, elf in like attack pose thrusting his spear or whatnot. And like that would be perfectly fine if you're making like a metal miniature. But as I've been trying to sort of sell with the whole philosophy behind this Kickstarter and the one before it, you have the means to make your models modular. And some designers see that, but they, they make like Games Workshop kit ripoffs. They do it where you print them the models off in their constituent parts of separate arms and things and you glue them together. What I've tried to do is all my models are made in Blender from like the same core bits. Um, like I have one head that's suspended in a 3D space in one position, one torso in one position, and everything else is just sort of toggled on and off around that. Even running legs, crouching legs, that kind of thing. Um, designers have the ability to, to structure their files in that way and leave it to the user to actually toggle and tailor their models as they want. And so if we stop thinking about things in terms of set poses, like this model has a spear and is doing this or, uh, or kits, and instead think about ourselves as trying to put out the tools that allow for tailoring, toggling, customization, that's what would make the medium really unique because that's something that uh, physical manufacturers can't actually model. But we're kind of so timid as designers that we're more trying to emulate what we've come from rather than like iterate upon it if if you get what i mean mm. uh, i think that it will get to the point where everyone has a 3d printer and perhaps when that's changed our expectations will change as well uh of what we want because there's just well i think i've already said it, there's just there's just no reason to confine ourselves to single sculpts and things um yeah well i think i alluded to this earlier on i think that toggle bit, the, the customization, the ability to make a bespoke army personal to yourself has got to be the most attractive aspect of this technology. Because if I buy a printer and just print off a monopose figure that I can have no input to, then there's not an, other than cost, there's not an awful lot difference to what I can buy already off the shelf from any other manufacturer. Uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm really just looking at the cost aspect of it. It's a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, but if the designers are providing the ability for me to go in and put a mus moustache on this guy or make this guy crouching or put a bear skin on the next guy, then that is something that's bespoke to me and has got to generate, I would imagine, 
and, and I can only speak for myself, but it's got to generate some excitement and ownership and and, and um, inclusivity from the, the, the end user, from the original producer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have so many people on the community group just sharing um, stuff they've printed and how they've modified it. One guy took my carbine cavalry and he deleted the carbines and replaced them with shotguns he found on the internet elsewhere and suddenly he had bushwhackers. Yeah. How and incredible that's quite is cool. that? How incredible is that? Yeah, I know. I I, I was taken aback because like I just <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. I yeah. just found it so cool. And and so people in in their own way are taking ownership of, of the stuff I've made, and uh, it's it's theirs at that point. Like that that is their army. I I don't. Uh, I did not have the thought to make bushwhackers. Like that's his creative possession. Um, another example would be as well. Um, if you wanted to collect. Peninsula and do Waterloo as well. You would need like two different box sets of British infantry. Um, one of the stretch goals in the Napoleonic project is Belgic Chacos. That's funded now, so you can literally just pop into a Blender, toggle off the stovepipe, toggle on Belgic, and there, with one purchase, you've got both campaigns like suitable to be covered. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I think it just sort of stands on its own merits there that it, it is about just giving the options. For the Amer where this idea came from for me was, um, I mean, I'd already made like my basic guy in a forage cap as a, no, sorry, he was in a Kepi, my first ACW figures. Uh, when I saw what Warlord had done and they, they put out their guys, I believe their sprues are like a mix of forage caps and uh, slouch hats. Mm. And if you want to do union, you need to take your clippers to the sprue and clip off the sides of the slouch hats. Mm. Um, I just looked at those and I thought, uh, how I'd done my models and how I have everything in the same place. I just thought, well, give everybody all the hats, you know, toggle them all and off. No, no hassle. Uh, and the, got... the other thing there, Henry, and this is where I, this is the only time I will ever class myself as one of the button counters is it, it's a real bone of contention for me where a company will sell um, a Confederate figure wearing a sack coat which historically they didn't do. So it was either sack coats or shell jackets. Mine are in shell jackets here. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it, these sort of details that... It is these sort of details that will put me off a range. Um, and it may, may seem pedantic. I will not... I won't generally shout it from the rooftops and say, I'm not going to find that, that set of figures because it, it, I, I don't consider it historically accurate and there's other options out there for me. But... Well, it's it's the burden of knowledge. If you know that and you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Yeah, then. once you've seen it, you you can't unsee it. Absolutely. Yeah, it niggles at you. Yeah, yeah. I um the I sort of um, I'm worried I'm giving away the trade secrets, but if you own the files, you can see it for yourselves. But um <clears throat> the the way the ACW figures are constructed is that they have a kind of base jacket model, which is just the upper half of the torso above the belt. Yeah. And that's the same on all the models. But what changes when you toggle things is how many buttons are on it. Yeah. And then there's a separate sort of skirt piece, the bottom half of the jacket. And that changes. So if you want a shell jacket, if you toggle that on, it just doesn't have anything on the lower half. Yes. Um, it has a different count of buttons. Uh, and I have a Confederate belt buckle as well. Um, <laughs> but if you toggle on sack coat, it has a plain uh, belt buckle. Yeah. Because, uh, well... I didn't know they didn't wear them at all. I thought both sides wore them. I knew that shell jackets are very particular to the Confederates, yes. but I thought both sides wore sex. It, it's um, a real bone of contention for me with the Civil War. Okay. So to hear that um, if if tomorrow I go and um, blow the, the, the food budget for the family uh, <laughs> on uh, a couple of these machines and then purchase the, uh, the files that I can print off, for me, what looked like to be authentic Confederate and Union infantry then. That, that is a huge seller but um just just on the technology side of things then and the the sort of reticence that you might get from people of my sort of age um you, you've talked about um how to guides mm -hmm. that I, I think you've already got there haven't you but you, you're able to provide that well, information as a, as a as a producer of content you're able to ease somebody into the process rather than them just buying the box of, of, of all this bits of kit and then trying to get on with it themselves. Uh, I was just sorry I was just trying to find the name of the back I was going to say we had one guy comment on the Kickstarter who said he's 78 and he's buying his first resin printer so 
was going to say you can never be too old no. to try shaving one else. Um, but yes, uh, with guides, um, I, I'm doing uh, video tutorials. I've made two so far. I'm oh, sorry, three if you include the one about Lichy Sizer, um, showing the, the workflow. So you can watch me doing it on YouTube and I will uh, annotate everything I'm pressing and why I'm pressing as well as you know, say it audibly. Um, the I can't guarantee it'll be completely ready on launch, but there definitely will be a written manual. Um, I've started writing that, and it will include some just general advice about painting and uh, and the battalions and things, you know, as if you don't know anything about the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but in addition to that, I would like to strongly recommend uh, go on Google and uh, search Wargaming 3D Idiot's Guide to 3D Printing, and um, there's a very good guide uh, there that was uh, written by the owner of uh, Wargaming 3D, and uh, it's how he personally approaches resin, uh, resin printing. And uh, I read that when I got started, and I found it to be very good advice. Um, there are a few things I wish people had told me when I got started, so I suppose I, I should quickly give those two uh, tips. I said one, which is put your build plate in hot water if you're having problems getting your, uh, your stuff off the plate. It makes it much more pliable. Uh, if you are using supports, make sure you use rafts, which are um, bits that the, the supports sprite, sprite out of. Yeah. They have a um, 45 degree angled side, so you can get your spatula under them very easily to remove bits. Um, use Litchi Slicer, not Shitubox. Uh, Shitubox is very popular because it's kind of like the default slicer, but it's a, it's a Chinese piece of rubbish, to be honest. Um, it's the Internet Explorer of 3D printing. Okay. What's what's um, the name of the one you recommend? Sorry, I've just uh, Litchi Slicer. That's L Y C H E E Litchi Slicer. Yeah. Uh, if you're resin printing, if you're um, if you're using an FTM printer, uh, most people use Cura, which is C U R A, which is it's all right, yeah. fine. I don't know of any alternatives. My my um, intention, Henry, is in the show notes. I'll put, I'll put up links to all of these things. So, if anybody is uh, curious enough to go out and and buy this kit tomorrow, then they'll have a. Oh yeah, well, and and shop. and please. Uh, sometimes I might be a little slow replying, but uh, people are free to to message me personally on Facebook. Um, I have a community group on there that I've I've tried to plug a few times subliminally. Um, it's called a uh, Turner Miniatures Community Group, and uh, I run it on there with my personal account. People either post in the group or you can write me directly. I'm happy to help with uh, any questions or queries within reason, of course. <laughs> and of course, I'll put a, up a link to that in the show notes as well. But, yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, um, just talking then um, a bit more about what you see as the the future of this business and that you, you honestly think that within within not an inordinate amount of time, then traditional sculpting of miniatures will be the exception to the norm is that where you see it being uh i appreciate you phrasing it that diplomatically because yes i, I, I tried I think very that, hard <laughs> yeah well there, there's always going to be a place for it and i i think especially if you're a tactile sort of person there's just something so special about metal miniatures yeah. i i do love the way they feel especially in 28 millimeter but oh and 15 mil actually god what am i saying um sorry this is a bit of a, a bit one quick side diversion, I know I've made a lot, but um, one reason I'm sculpting Cold War Soviets is because I do not like plastic 10 and 15 mil figures mm -hmm. uh, because they're often monopose. Yes. And I wanted to do a project where every single, this is this is the scope of this next one, which hasn't got a name yet. <laughs> uh, I want every figure in a Soviet company to have an individual pose. Um, that will be something. Yeah, that'll be cool. Yeah. But generally, you have to buy metal figures to accomplish that. So yes. I love, I love the feeling of metal. Um, but yes, I, 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 I don't, I don't know because any comments one makes now are just bound to age poorly, right? But uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll hope to but, do it, Henry, in five years' time. <laughs> I, I should think that plastic injection models are not going to go away because even if 3D printing is taken up by everyone, um, there will be a convenience factor because let's, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm being a very naughty boy. And, um, currently because I'm looking for a gaming group, like I said, I'm, I'm thinking of getting back into 40 K just to, you know, have the flexibility. Mm -hmm. And I, I, like a very naughty boy, I'm, I'm printing off some chaos space Marine. Yeah. Um, but 
the support work to get just one kit of those ready is a few hours. Right. Like just putting supports on there. And I know people say that maybe you might spend a few hours assembling a plastic kit, but the, the fact is to print non-simplistic models. And one reason why a big um, unique selling point of my Kickstarter is the fact that they're supportless and why this is good for people is that it can be a real headache to support figures. Um, so that's going to be an inconvenience for some. So I, I should think there'll always be people who want to buy plastic kits just to get around the legwork one has to do around 3D printing. But if it won't altogether replace, certainly not plastics and perhaps not metals, it will just be there as a sort of go-to for when people want something cheap, but particularly something individual. Um, and I think it's inevitable, and I'm probably sort of sowing the seeds for my own demise, or at least you know the demise of my own profession, when I keep encouraging people to get into Blender, because the more people realize it's not that difficult, the more people are going to start sculpting things. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> I think people will just you know start, perhaps they'll buy a base sculpt and then sort of tweak it. Uh, one uh, term you come across a lot in 3D printing is remixes. You might have seen that. Right, no, I've not heard of that. Uh, people, uh, people are upload a model other guy downloads it and changes it right and that's called a remix so people will just be kind of tailor making their armies and uh yeah well that's a, that, that seems to be okay for personal use but don't we get into oh, yeah. an issue of um ownership of, of the rights to that original sculpt or how much it's been modified to say that this is now my own yes so um uh Retailers like uh, My Mini Factory. Um, so I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll just drop some websites for people. Again, if you need the links, I can give them to you um, and you can put them in the description. Yeah, but that'd be great. Common, common places where people buy their models. Uh, Wargaming 3D, go to place for historicals. Uh, My Mini Factory, I, I think I'd be correct in saying that's the biggest sort of STL market. Uh, I'm partnered with them for this Kickstarter. They're doing all the fulfillment. And uh, yeah, they've been very good. Sorry, shout out to My Mini Factory. Thank you very much. Thank you um cg trader and cults and these are places where you download stls all of them to my knowledge are quite rigorous in protecting ip it's like okay. yes if someone steals your work they will be on your side um but obviously the downside of this medium is that if people get your files they can distribute them and um <clears throat> piracy is a common thing yeah. with historicals not so much because as you said uh, well as, as we said earlier a lot of people are very supportive and they want you to succeed and like they they would be genuinely sort of horrified at the prospect of undermining designers especially since historicals are rather niche um if you look at like let's charitably call them games workshop inspired uh <laughs> 3d files um they're much more common and piracy is massive uh, there are so many telegram chats and secret facebook groups where people share links or, or files that are paid files that someone has bought and has then decided to share or sometimes they'll club together and buy everything as a collective and uh yeah it's really common but a lot of people feel kind of justified in doing it i'm not saying they are i'm just saying this is what their defense is they'll, they'll say that because a lot of this work is essentially just aping games workshop it's already kind of stolen mm. Uh, fortunately, in the in the historicals market, we it's not such a problem. I've yet to find evidence of anyone having pirated my work. I I'm sure it's happened, but I I don't know about it yet. Um, but yes, uh, generally anything I sell, not generally, sorry, without exception, anything I sell is for personal use only. I will say that if uh, if someone has maybe like got some files and they have a printer, and then some friend of theirs at their club wants the same thing. Uh, but doesn't have a printer. I wouldn't know what happens in that situation. But what what would be nice for me is if uh, the second person just buys the file, and then yeah, the first guy can print it for them. But, but yeah, uh, because th this actually came up um, in the chat with Felix that they've off actually offered a commercial license as part of their their pledge. Well, I, I've one... got to say I've never heard of that before. Yeah, I have one too. Um, sorry, I'm. I am a terrible creator. If we've got this far in, I haven't even plugged my Patreon. Oh, it's <laughs> another link for the description. Um, yeah, I have a um, a commercial uh, licensed here as well. It's uh, I can't remember if it's thirty dollars or thirty five dollars a month. Um, but with that, people have the right to produce and yeah, sell my files. Right. Uh, if they pay that every month. Um, but there is the caveat that I don't allow them to make molds out of it. It's only three D printed objects. Yeah. Like they can't take that and make a master with it or something. Um, but yes, that's that's very common. Uh, most creators have some kind of uh, licensing deal, mostly because uh, 
we're constantly being approached from people saying, hey, I don't have a printer. Could you print them for me? And to be honest, um, sorry if I'm soapboxing a bit, but uh, for me, I've dabbled with offering physical products before. But what I find is that I'm, I'm at a point where every spare moment I have, I can dedicate to designing and designing correlates to output, which correlates to money ultimately because I'm paid for my ranges. And so the opportunity cost is there that anytime I'm not spent, I don't spend designing and I spend, say, packaging a product, printing off a product is time I'm not designing. And so it doesn't work out as especially profitable for me. And uh, you open yourself up to so much more strain when you're fulfilling physical orders. Stuff can go wrong with the post. Stuff can break in the post. Um, I've decided I, I will rely entirely on uh, licensees. So if anyone wants my stuff but doesn't want to get a printer, they, they, they'll they have to talk to people with a license. Yeah. But yeah, most, most creators uh, offer something like that. Um, another question that's just popped into my mind is um, how much does it depend on the quality of the machine that you've got? Um, I, I, I know it sounds like such an obvious question. If you buy cheap, then you've, you, you're potentially going to get a, um, a, well, a, let's, a, let's... not a great output from it. But um, I, and I think I'm talking about the future of, of the product here, but just how good can these machines get? And is it a stupid question to say, does it depend on how much money you're going to spend on one of these machines? Everything, if people go on the Kickstarter and they like what's in the pictures, that was all printed on a cheap entry-level machine. Yeah. So. And that's the Alagoo that you've talked about. Already. Yeah, the Alagoo Mars 2 Pro, yeah. yes. Um, which I don't know if I could say it's the cheapest, but I would not go cheaper than that. Yeah. Uh, any any Cubic and Alagoo are both touted as the, the two go-to beginner brands. Um, but make sure you get a mono one. That's all I can say. There is literally no reason to get any of the older machines yeah. because the mono uh, prints faster and is just as detailed and the screens have a longer life than the old ones did. Um, in terms of how quality correlates with the machine, uh, the resolution of the screen and the build plate size are the two things that matter. Now, I'm not a very technical person, uh, so I can't entirely explain it, but I hope I can sort of guess at it. Um, the, the screen is like narrowed or reflected through sciencey stuff. Uh, <laughs> That's the smaller the build... magic, isn't it, Henry? <laughs> yeah. Well, if you've got a small build plate yeah. and the screen is like using mirrors or some kind of distortion is is larger than that build plate but gets sort of like the light is narrowed into that surface area the smaller the build plate the higher the effective resolution I, i'm hoping that people can infer what i'm trying to describe there um so. <laughs> the machines with the smaller plates if we have the same okay let's just say we have several machines with the same size screen yeah if the only difference is of the size of the plates the smaller the plate the more detailed the print right so um Generally, the larger your build plate, the less detail it is. There are some machines that have very, very good screens and big build plates. Um, just check reviews, I guess. I can't name the machines because I've never strayed beyond the, the Mars, unfortunately. But uh, your best bet would be to get like a big 4K screen on a very small build plate if you were doing the most detailed six mils you could. But if, if people like what's in the pictures, that's that. But the other thing to mention is resin. Um, I have only ever used good quality resin because when I got into resin printing, one of my test printers gave me advice. He recommended Nova 3D, which is the brand I use. And I've never tried bad resin, but uh, apparently if you've got worse resin, you will get worse results. Yeah. I don't have first-hand experience of that, but those are the two, the two big things, your choice of machine and choice of resin. But if you go with an Elegoo Mars 2 Pro, you will be able to replicate what's on the Kickstarter. Okay, if, so... That's not yeah, so uh, basically, if listeners are out there thinking, well, there's a, a budget machine here that costs 100 quid and uh, some resin that costs 15 quid, then they, they can't expect to get what they're seeing on the screen. No, no, I, 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 stand, I stand by what I just said about uh, don't go cheaper than yeah. Alagu. Yeah. Okay. Um, what, what, do you think there are any limits of this technology in relation to the hobby? Uh, hmm. All right. It's the first time I'm going to shut up and think my answer through. <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be right. There's, 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 oh yeah, it has to happen yeah, sometimes, doesn't yeah. it? 
Um, I, th I think one of the, the most common questions that I hear when people who are 3D curious or interested in the technology and where this might end up is is whether we we can get to the stage where you can 3D print in colour. And I, I know oh. I, I'm told that there's already technology out there that that may be heading in that direction. You could get coloured resin and pause your print and then resume, but no, I I don't know about that. Uh, to be honest, no. um, I mean, oh gosh, no, no, I, I I wouldn't be able to get out on a limb and, and say anything about that. For me, what I would love and have wanted since like day one of getting started, and I've heard does exist on some machines, is a variable layer height, which we have in FDM but not in resin. To explain uh, what that is and why it's important, I, I described that the machine moves 0 0.02 millimeters yeah. each increment. My machine can only do that. So if I set that as my setting, I choose my layer height, 0 0.02 millimeters, it will do that for the entire file. But if you're doing a supported file, say a 28 millimeter figure, it will be lying at like 45 degrees on top of uh, supports, which are like big stilts holding it suspended. My machine will print the supports, which will be like the first third of the layers, say, yeah. at 0 0.02 millimeters, this very detailed layer height, but it's just supports, it's just a pole. Yeah. It's really frustrating because it's wasting time and screen light. Yeah. Um, that's the big innovation I want to see, and apparently they've already done it, but um, I, I can't take advantage of that myself. Uh, if I got another printer, I would look for one that had that, because if you're doing a lot of supported printing, it's a thing. Me, personally, I wouldn't want to print in color. I love painting. That's like my main attraction to the hobby. Painting six mils to the levels that I tried, though, was hell on earth. I would not recommend that. Um, but, yeah, I like 15 mil. There, <laughs> there are a lot of it. guides out there, Henry. I, I recommend you uh, <laughs> take take a look at one of the two of the, um, the speed painting guides, let's say. Yeah, um, well, uh, I think if I take up an actual army, I would. Um, yeah. yeah. I, th I think for the display purposes, you've done an absolutely fantastic job. And I, f I feel your pain for... <laughs> spending the time that you have uh, painted them but it's well worth the effort because it shows I, I, I want to take a time machine back and find whoever thought it was a good idea to make cross belts white and just smack yeah, them exactly, yeah. it's a, it's a, cross belts are the bane of the 6 mil war gamers life I will tell you that much um, ok so uh, this is a technology that's clearly here to stay um, and is only going to improve from what my, my late person would say uh, and it's becoming even more readily accessible i know that um aaron from project wargamer uh, who i mentioned i don't know if it was in the pre-ramble or, or during the podcast but he, he was quite pleased that i was um speaking to yourself henry i don't know if you've had any contact with him at all but he's yeah, the name's there. familiar uh, I, i'm just gonna just gonna check if you i um like a proper businessman, you know, I reached out to as many different channels as I could to try to get them sample models and things. I'm just trying to remind myself, was that one of the people I spoke to? Well, okay, either way, if I don't remember off the top of my head, it means I'd be insincere if I said I was definitely sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah Project like, Wargamer is familiar, yes. Yeah, he's, he's, he was certainly interested uh, that uh, you were coming on onto the podcast because, um, as I mentioned earlier, he's he's essentially now a self-sufficient Wargamer in the sense that he doesn't have to buy any off-the-shelf products if he doesn't want to. He can, uh, he can basically print every building, every tree, every figure, every base that he wants. Um, and I think personally, that's a scary point to be <laughs> if I am a traditional manufacturer. Yeah, um, I, I think. <sighs> I think it's going to be one of those things where we're going to see it's about how they move with the times. Yeah. Uh, one of the big, you know, business studies case studies would be in the US. It was Sears, I think, that didn't go in with the internet. They dismissed it. It's like a fad. Yeah. Was it Sears? Well, either way, you, you know what I mean? Like the internet comes along and uh, yes, yeah, Sears, they, they famously stuck with catalogs, like paper catalogs. Right. I think, I, God, I, I don't remember. But what I mean is it's going to be about how they move with the times. Now, I've mentioned Games Workshop. and I'm Sorry, sorry, sorry. But one more thing I would say about them is right now they're in a position where they're already making so much money off of their IP. You know, they license it out to all these games and things. It's actually quite a big interest for them. If I were in Games Workshop shoes, I would just start thinking about offering STLs alongside the rest of their product line yeah. because we're at a point now where nearly any 40K unit you can think of has an STL 
like we already have the comprehensive library yeah and if they don't like jump on that well yesterday uh they'll just find like they're kind of cut out of their own market yeah. i think and especially if you've got overheads of running physical shops and things and it's sort of the same for historicals um Again, I worry I'm shooting myself in the foot right now because there might be someone listening who's thinking about sculpting historicals. Now I'm going to push them in. But there are still a lot of untapped markets. Um, I have to be honest. Um, I'm very happy that I listened to your interview with Felix because uh, I he, he turned out to be a very nice guy. And so I'm, I'm happy for him. I'm just glad to sort of put a voice to the to the to the name. Uh, but I, I saw that Kickstarter come on. I was kicking myself because I wanted to do um, I wanted to do a pre Marian. Wait, not pre marian sorry. Oh, God. Pre-Imperial um, Romans yes. myself at some point, and he's beat me to the punch. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a Wild West in that in that case. There are a lot of periods that haven't had, like, comprehensive ranges put out. Yeah. And I think even in maybe one year, two years, it's going to be a much more saturated market than it is now. Mm -hmm. And uh, all that will be the, the main impetus or the main thing supporting companies like, say, Warlord, uh, will be people who are conservative with a small C who, or, you know, who maybe their living situation doesn't really allow for owning a 3D printer. You know, like if you're living in like literally like a cupboard or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's going to be like what, what's mainly keeping them going. But even now, like if you want to model a given period, th there will probably be files for it. Even if there aren't, you can, you can commission people. Um, there, there are artists that work on commission. Like, or you can design the damn files yourselves, you know. And I suspect also that uh, periods of history that traditional manufacturers might not consider commercially viable would be more than viable within 3D printing because oh, yeah. you're, you, you talked about producing the vast content of the Napoleonic range within three weeks. And, and that's Napoleonics, which is a rabbit hole to disappear down as a designer. Um, but if you were looking at something, so another period of interest, for example, for me is the Spanish Civil War. So, mm. uh, and there are ranges out there in 15 mil, in 6 mil, in, in 28 mil. But I don't know of anything yet that's in the 3D well, world. T t tell you what, off the top of my head, what I would do right now, if you said, Henry, make a Spanish Civil War miniature, I would hop on Blender, I would import my American Civil War jacket template and my trousers and my feet and my head and my hands. Um, I would sculpt like a Mauser or a Mosin again. I don't really know what the go-to would be. Um, and I'd rig it up with that. And I would probably add in like the sack coat collar, tailor it a bit. And then what? I'd be sculpting like headgear and cleaning up the pose. And I would probably have like a miniature done within a couple of hours. Yeah. Um, once you're... Once you've sculpted a lot and you kind of have a library to fall back on of standardized parts or parts that are easily tweaked, um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to cover obscure things. And one thing that's surprising me, uh, you, you're right about like niche stuff, like being doable and even popular, like, even having a market for it. I have had maybe three separate people uh, in the last uh, month asking me to do like uh, river boats for the Sudan. And um <laughs> I know nothing about that, but like it's just it's just surprising me that you hear the same things again and again. Yeah. People want me to follow on the Napoleonics of the Crimean War, though I don't think you can necessarily call that niche. Uh, There's not a lot doing... out there, Henry, uh, in the Crimean War because I I, um, I painted some six mil uh, Crimean figures from irregular miniatures last year or the year before. Time has lost a lot of meaning in, in yes. the last eighteen months, but um, those sculpts are possibly twenty twenty five years old. Um, and I'm not sure the molds have changed during that point during that time, uh, and that's it really in in six mil. And people who would gain the Crimean War in six mil would proxy in figures from the Napoleonic ranges or other uh, mid to late nineteenth century ranges. But a bespoke range in six mil using modern three D printed techniques. I imagine would sell like proverbial hotcakes. To be honest. All right. Well, uh, so um, I don't know how personal to necessarily get, but this is a massive source of anxiety for me. Um, and part of the reason why I feel like I can't ever not work is I feel like I need to cover as much as I can because I really believed it when I said that in like about two years, all this stuff is going to get covered. Yeah. People are entering the hobby every, every day. And me being the greedy capitalist pig, I want to be the 
first to beat everyone to the punch. Um, so now, now I'm gonna I'm gonna lose sleep tonight thinking about oh god, should I be doing a Crimean walk? <laughs> well, uh, you know, a lot of the sculpts that you've already got there, certainly the Napoleonic era, um, I, I imagine you would be able to transport in and just change bits here and there. Yeah, and then. I'm I'm trying not to beat myself up if I get beaten to the punch. Like I said, I, I had wanted to do Republican Romans, yeah. didn't make it in time. Doesn't mean I can't ever do them because uh, like, uh, uh, we have a bit of a, a community kind of growing, and I'm sure that I think that's the most important thing. Like when you're a creator, just work on your reputation, get some trust, and then people will probably support you. And if you cover something that's already been done, because they'll like perhaps your take on it, whatever. Well, listen, there's there must be two dozen uh, manufacturers that produce uh, Republican Romans and, and uh, Carthaginians in 15 mil. Uh, there's several ranges in 6 mil and there's ranges as long as your arm in 28 mil that cover the same sure. period. So there's room for more than one person uh, or one company to produce the, these ranges. Yes, you don't want to be in immediate uh, competition from the get-go, but you know, in in six, twelve, eighteen months' time down the road, uh, your personal take on a range that's already out there will draw in customers because you'll you'll develop um, uh, some customer loyalty and brand loyalty uh, to to your particular brand. Similar to me with Peter Pig, um, just about every range that Peter Pig produced, I'll buy figures for just because I like the figures. Oh yeah, sorry. Please do tell him that I love his ships. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I I actually am very like sincerely envious of him because, uh, like I said, when I was doing mine, they were sort of just uh, exact copies of historical plans, and I felt like I actually I don't consider myself a very artistic person. I, I I'm more kind of just straightforward. I don't really have a word to describe what I'm, I'm trying to mean, but I mean I don't have that that flair. And yeah. when you look at his sculpts, like they're so just characterful. Yes. And I, I really wish I could have just lent some sort of personality to mine, but no, mine, mine are literally just representations of what they literally would have looked like yeah. without any kind of imagination added onto it. He, he has amazing flair uh, with his, uh, with his pirate ships. Yeah. And I, uh, I wanted to buy some while I was in Russia, but uh, again, I, I was just worried about the logistics. I, and I, 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 I've, sorry. I've glued about twenty-two together this morning, um, and I'm cool. staring at them uh, over the. Uh, over the other side of the room. In fact, th those pirate ships are on a on a, a piece of wood in uh, on, on a sh uh, sort of a um, it's it's the window uh, sill, but it's about three foot deep. It's it's a real three it's a real deep window sill. And uh, whilst we've been talking, I thought three D printer could fit in that space quite easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I know a guy who sells some ships. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, have you got your coat opening? You just sort of. <laughs> yeah, I have some ships for sale. <laughs> um, Henry, that's been an absolutely fascinating insight in into your world of three uh, D printing, um, and I wish you every success. Uh, and I genuinely mean that because I, I can genuinely hear the passion that's coming over from yourself for this product that you've got and, and this this uh, business model that you've got that is getting the word out there for, for these figures. And if, I, if, if tomorrow um, my daughter goes hungry and has no shoes <laughs> to go to school in, uh, I, I will blame you. I'll send my wife your way. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it is something that I feel myself edging closer and closer to. Aaron uh, from Project Wargaming in the, in the States, he's... He's, uh, he, he fairly regularly sends me messages or, or photos or clips or something to try and tempt me further. <laughs> and, and as a Catholic priest as he, he is, as, as I do say to him, you're supposed to lead me away from temptation, <laughs> not towards it. <laughs> but I think in this sense, yeah, yeah. He, he's, uh, he's quite happy to lead me towards the temptation. And uh, Speaking to you for the last couple of hours, Henry, has, uh, has done nothing to uh, oh. turn me off that path. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much for uh, for your time and and for the exposure. And uh, yeah, I, I I suppose uh, I'm passionate about it simply because, uh, as I sort of alluded to earlier, this is the the first job I've ever had that I actually like. And, uh, <laughs> I would very much like to keep it. There's a lot to be said for that, Henry. Um, for any guest that comes onto this podcast, um, there's there's two demands that I make. Um, yeah. But it doesn't involve money, 
So. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> so uh, rest easy. You don't need to get into your wallet. But the first one is is easier than the second. The first is that uh, you agree to come back onto the show and uh, talk further uh, about your your business, your your products, uh, and your gaming life. So if this hasn't been too painful, uh, would you be willing to return to the show and have another chat? Uh, yes, absolutely, and uh, we can try push it past three hours that time. <laughs> yes, yes. We've done quite well tonight, haven't we? Considering I said, let's look around about the 60-minute mark, and, uh, yeah, we've, we've uh... sailed past that. We've sailed past that. <laughs> talk for England, I'm sorry. No, no listen, uh, as, I've, as I said, and again, I don't know if it's in the pre-ramble or actually on the podcast, the more you talk and the less I talk, uh, the better. People people don't come to this podcast to listen to me to talk. Well, you might as well slap the preamble on the, on the end of this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't worry. Really push it. So, sorry, let's hit me with your second painful question. The here. second painful question is yeah. uh, there is a, a thing called the God's Own Scale Virtual Library. So this is, if you imagine um, a virtual reality library, um, there are several, well, there must be dozens of shelves now within the library that have been uh, populated by books recommended by guests on the show and seen some on, I think it's episode 35. I, I seem to have lost count somewhere along the way. It's roughly episode 35. Uh, and people can leave any amount of books on the shelves uh, that they wish. Uh, I think the last guest left four on the shelves. Um, oh, but it's up to you. But I, I, it's generally uh, a book on history, uh, military history, uh, and or war gaming. So uh, I'm going to ask you to deposit a book within the uh, God's Own Scale virtual library. I'm desperately hoping you've got one prepared for me. Henry. Yes, yes, you, you warned me. I did. Um, <laughs> So uh, I think because of where I got started with uh, with designing, um, it was ships, as, as we know, and that was born actually of like a, a necessity on my part. Like I wanted ships to paint. And the reason for that was that at the time I was just sort of a man obsessed with the age of sail. Uh, I, I'm a very kind of visual person. I'm prone to fantasy, especially when in the grim darkness that is Russia. So. I was trying to fantasize about better things, better places. And, and a big part of that was that at the time I was absolutely absorbed by the Hornblower series. Oh, wonderful. Um, so I'm afraid, I know, I know you said historical book and war gaming. I'm going to, I'm going to ask Mr. Midship and Hornblower go in there. Oh no, absolutely. Uh, Hornblower. I, I think we may have had one Hornblower book uh, put on the shelves already, but um, no, absolutely. Historical base fiction absolutely has a place on the shelves of the God's Own Scale Virtual Library. They're, they're, they're wonderful books, and I'll admit that they could perhaps spend a bit more time focusing on day-to-day -day stuff. That is something I might have liked to have seen more, you know, just some kind of flavor of what it was like to live day by day on the ships and rating characters' points of view. But in general, broad strokes, they're just, they're just wonderful stories. And for some reason, Master and Commander hasn't really gripped me in the same way that... Uh, Hornblower did. I don't know why. It's it's funny you mention that. I was listening to a, a podcast called uh, "The Rest Is History," which is Tom Holland and I'm going to forget the second guy's name, but they were talking about uh, Master and Commander. And Tom Holland uh, is is written numerous histo history books. Previously uh, said that um, the the writer uh, is it Patrick O'Brien uh, took yeah. twelve pages to, and, and was just talking about a piece of rope. Uh, so he gave up. <laughs> so uh, clearly, uh, yeah, you, you clearly have the same approach to Mr. Holland. But, so. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat, yes. Yeah. Some bits are really good. Um, I remember because I was trying to think about how to rig my ship. So then there's a scene where um, a new, uh, sorry, a midshipman takes the maturing up into the, the mast and is telling him the names of all the different um, ropes. I thought, oh, well, that, that's good. I should take note of what page this is and come back to it later. Of course, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. It's. I think it's good if uh, if you're already a bit of a whatever the naval equivalent of a button counter is, yes. a, a plank counter or whatever. Well, I, th I think generally nerd fits most of these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We know well, where Hornblower, we're. Hornblower is much more sort of broad strokes. Like uh, the little details are kind of passed over. Just. In... I, I'll admit, I've I've never read one. Um, oh. That's a that's a shocking uh, admission to make. I know, but I, I should really go and download one onto the Kindle straight away and. Uh, Oh yeah, give it a yeah, try. I, I personally have a lot of empathy for the uh, introverted character who people believe is competent, but inside is uh, generally a, 
simmering pile of self doubt. <laughs> You're right. I, I may well associate with that. <laughs> it could be somebody I, I associate with, but uh, uh, right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that recommendation, Henry. Uh, once again, thanks for your time. It's been a Thank real you. blast to speak to you, and I, I, I know that the Kickstarter is going blazing guns at the moment, and I, I really hope. Uh, it reaches that goal where you can build that that ship at the end of it. Oh yeah, that that'll be be wonderful. Um, yeah, maybe um, maybe we'll get you back on the show if if that happens. Uh, once once you've sculpted it, and we can uh, talk a bit more about uh, rope and uh, and ships. Sure, I will say if it doesn't fund, maybe um, on my Patreon we have two polls I run every month. Uh, one for a figure, one for a ship. Uh, people vote on what they want me to make. Um, I might put like a larger scale boat on there if this one fails, but I probably shouldn't say that because that'll make people feel less urgency in funding this one. But uh, well, it, I will find a way to do it. Let's face it; it's only the the absolute hardcore listeners who have reached this point of the uh, podcast. So, I think hi, mum. <laughs> I think your secret's safe with me, uh, Henry. Thanks very much for your time, and hopefully, speak to you soon. Yep. Good night. Hope I didn't keep you away from your beauty sleep. <laughs> Not at all. Brother Bertie went away to do his bit the other day. With the smile on his lips and his left pen and pips upon his shoulder, bright and gay. As the train moved out, he said, Remember me to all the birds. Then he wagged his paw and went away to all, shouting out these pathetic words. Goodbye, goodbye, oh, I'm dear, baby dear from your eye. Though it's hard to pass, I know, I know, I'll be sick of the death, it goes so dry. Don't die, there's a silver lining in the sky. Oh, ma, oh, sing, kill, yo, chin, chin, na, boo, too, blue, goodbye. Concert down at Q, some convalescent dressed in blue. Had to hear Lady Lee, who had turned 83, sing all the old, old songs she knew. Then she made a speech and said, I look upon you boys with pride. And for what you've done, I'm going to kiss each one. Then they all grabbed their sticks and cried. Goodbye. Goodbye, oh, and the dear baby dear from your eye. Though it's hard to part, I know, I know. I'll be sick of the death to go. Don't cry, don't cry. There's a silver lining in the sky. But my old sing, cheery, oh, chin, chin, na, boo, too, blue, goodbye. Little private Patrick saw. He was the prisoner of war. Till the hun with the gun called it pig dog for fun and paddy punched him on the door. Right across the barbed wire fence, the German dropped then a dear, oh dear. All the wire gave away and paddy yelled hooray as he ran for the Dutch frontier. Goodbye, goodbye, oh I said, dear baby, dear from your eyes. Though it's hard to pass, I know, I know, I'll be nickel and it's a go, don't cry, don't cry, there's a silver lining in the sky, 